I want to say a, a, a hearty thank you um, and welcome to everybody. I'm really glad you're all here. This is, uh, it, it just feels so good to have real people, you know, in a room rather than just little Hollywood Square things, you know. Um, my name is John Hamry, uh, president here at CSIS and very, uh, this is our flagship event every year, you know, and it's um, to highlight, you know, the security, I mean, our provenance as a think tank is a defense think tank. And so it's really important for this opportunity, and, uh, and I want to say thank you to everybody and for such a rich program. I, I think, uh, I do want to say deep thanks to Bill Lynn, uh, Matthew Green for uh, their support. You know, uh, Leonardo DRS has been supporting this now for 13 years. And uh, so just to, this is, this is, they didn't ask me to do this, but yesterday they won a billion dollar contract for the propulsion system on the Columbia class. Okay, they're now an American company. It's just so good. I, I, it's, it, we now get the best of Italian engineering helping keep our submarine safe. So, um, Wonderful. Yesterday really was, it wasn't just because of Leonardo's win. What was really, I, and I, I t talked a bit about this last night, you know, yesterday was a momentous day because Finland became an ally. Unbelievable how important that is. Um, I remember going 25 years ago when I was deputy secretary, I first went to Finland and talked to the state secretary, you guys ought to join NATO. And he was very polite, and he, he said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, he just brushed me off, which is, at that time was probably appropriate. But, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin has changed the landscape. And the clear malevolence that we now have to live with in Europe, which is a real threat, led Finland to say, we need to be a part of this alliance. And they've strengthened this alliance by joining it. It's the, they're a very capable, competent military. And uh, I, I would celebrate that. But there was a, a larger and more important um, aspect to this, which is it's, it, there's no Finlandization option now to end the Ukraine war. I mean, that may have been a possibility. There isn't a Finlandization option now. And we now have to internalize in our own thinking how we're going to defend ourselves in the East in a way that incorporates Ukraine. Now, that's a big and kind of scary thought. I'm, I'm way out there. I personally think we ought to bring Ukraine into NATO right away. You know, our best defense in the future is, is to rebuild Ukraine. But Ukraine on its own cannot establish a deterrence framework against Russia. You know, so we just have to start thinking bigger ideas about this. That may not be the right answer, I mean, but we do, we do need a strategic framework that talks about the long-term Security, the security of, of Europe over 30 years, not the next 18 months. And I know we're going to get out to that. This, we've got such, such a great lineup today, and, and so I, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to all of this. And uh, so thank you all. Uh, you're vitally important in this conversation because your questions are going to stimulate these intellects to even better ideas and thoughts. So please be active in this conversation. You know, I, we, are, we have been partnered with uh, Leonardo DRS, and, you know, we're very, very fortunate that uh, we have the president of uh, Leonardo with us today. And um, it's, it's, it is a wonderful company, uh, but they want to be a trusted partner into the American industrial base. And I think under, under Mr. Profumo's leadership, that's gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's a very good thing. So if I could, if I could turn to Mr. We, we, you're here with us virtually, and, <laughs> and I'm delighted that you're here, Mr. Profum. Let me turn to you to, that, so. to get this going. Uh, we, we don't have audio. Let's, can we get that? Do you hear me? Okay, now we can. Yep. I'm okay. Connected. Thank you. Go ahead. Now, first of all, many thanks, John, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. And really, I do apologize by the fact that I'm not there with you. 
Uh, so I hope that I'm the only one uh, uh, in video and all the other are present in person. Next time, uh, I'll, I'll promise you that I'll be there. Today, uh, we are uh, in uh, pretty close to the uh, end uh, of the mandate of our board, so it's uh, not easy to travel in these days. Having said that, uh, uh, welcome again to the 13th Annual Global uh, Security Forum. Leonardo DRS and Leonardo, if I can say so, has sponsored this important event since uh, its inception, and we are so pleased to be associated with it again today. Uh, this year, the Global Security Forum is focused on uh, transatlantic uh, defense. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has thrust Europe into the spotlight, raising important questions about the challenges Europe and NATO must address on their eastern borders and the broader collective responsibility free democracies around the world face to maintain a just world order. A world that is uh, fast changing to the worst, unfortunately, and forces government, institutions and industries to adjust to a new normal and shift to a, an, a, an economy of crisis, if not an economy of war. Never in the last decades, European territorial integrity and the security and safety of its citizens was under direct threat. Now, this is the reality we are facing. There is therefore clear need to rebuild a credible defense and deterrence capability, and industry is ready to provide its contribution. Today, panelists have a depth knowledge that will be instrumental to answer these questions defense and industrial cooperation, technology transfer, munition stockpiles, interoperability and interchangeability will all surely, surely surface as topics of debate throughout the day, as well as other important factors for consideration. You will hear from senior government officials and military officers, public policy analysts and defense industry representatives all of whom are incredibly well positioned to provide their insight and experience to the issue at the end. So again, welcome. Let me close by thanking again John Ambre and the talented team of CIS for organizing today's forum. Leonardo and Leonardo De Reis are proud to be associated with CIS and the Global Security Forum, and we look forward to a compelling and provocative dialogue today. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mr. Profumo, and thanks to all of you again for joining. My name is Seth Jones. I'm the director of the International Security Program here at CSIS and senior vice president. Uh, just want to introduce our first panel and give you a little bit of a sense for how we structured this day uh, in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we have designed really a day that focuses first on understanding this landscape. Um, the purpose of the first panel is uh, uh, that will be chaired by my colleague Emily Harding will focus on that landscape and how it is evolving. Uh, then we'll move into a discussion with the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an American uh, perspective uh, from the Joint Staff on how the U.S. is uh, thinking about its industrial base, uh, its position in Europe in the context of uh, U.S. interests in the uh, Indo-Pacific and other areas, uh, and then broader implications for how uh, the chairman and the vice chairman and senior Pentagon leaders are thinking about the evolution of competition and warfare. Uh, then we'll move in the afternoon to looking at the challenges of uh, European defense and opportunities. We'll have colleagues from uh, Germany and France, uh, as well as uh, one of our uh, former colleagues here at CSIS, Heather Connolly, who's the president of the German Marshall Fund. And then we'll finish uh, on a, a discussion on the defense industrial base and cooperation across the transatlantic on avenues uh, to uh, better think about cooperation, coordination in the industrial base. So that's how we've structured this day. Uh, with that, I will turn this over to my colleague, Emily Harding, for the first panel. Uh, Emily joined uh, CSIS uh, as Deputy Staff Director from the Senate 
Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, before that, Emily was uh, uh, an analyst and manager at the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, also uh, spent a tour at the National Security Council at the White House. So she is well positioned from her time um, on the Hill at CIA and at the White House to have a conversation, a lead a conversation on the threat landscape in Europe. So Emily, with that, I will turn this over to you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Seth. Uh, and welcome to our distinguished panel. So up here with me, I have Ambassador Mark Makarovsky, who worked as a reporter, editor, and columnist for over 20 years prior to becoming Poland's ambassador to the US. He served as the head of the economic and foreign affairs desks at several leading newspapers and editor in chief of another. In 2015, he entered government service, working for the Chancellery of the President as an expert on public diplomacy, then as head of the press office, Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His previous overseas posting was as ambassador to Israel. And we are hoping that today you bring both your keen journalist's eye and also your official positions of the government of Poland uh, to our discussion. We also have Rear Admiral Tim Woods. He became the British Defense Attaché here in Washington this spring, so welcome to him. A warm welcome from a beautiful DC spring. Uh, he's coming from Kyiv, where he was the British Defense Attaché at the front line of the UK's support to the Ukrainian military. He also has served as the head of the British Defense Staff in Eastern Europe, commanding all defense attaches across Belarus, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Ukraine. Quite a comprehensive job. Um, we're looking forward to exploring the, the run-up to the war with you. His previous roles have included active duty in Afghanistan, deployments to the Far East, submarine patrols, secondments to NATO, the UK Ministry of Defense, and the National Security Secretariat. And then I'm also pleased to have on stage my former boss and one of my best bosses ever, uh, John McLaughlin. He was the former deputy director of the CIA and is currently a distinguished practitioner in residence at SICE right across the street, which is also his alma mater. He served as acting director of CIA in 2004 and as deputy director from 2000 to 2004. His CIA career spanned three decades, and it is completely fair to say that his leadership shaped the modern practice of intelligence, certainly shaped my career. His career included roles as Deputy Director for Intelligence, Vice Chairman for Estimates, and Acting Chairman of the NIC. Uh, he served as the Director of the Office of European Analysis during the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And after the breakup of the Soviet Union, he represented the intelligence community on the US diplomatic missions that established relations with these newly independent countries. So we have quite the distinguished panel to launch us off today in a strategic discussion about Europe. So let's start by going back to late 2021 in the run-up to the, the war, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, opinion was divided at that point on whether Putin would really do something as audacious as launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Richard Betts once noted in his analysis of surprise attacks, War involves discontinuity, an aberration or divergence from normal. So it is hard to imagine, sort of by definition. So first, I want to start with you, Mr. Ambassador, about how your country and how you saw the landscape in Europe in the run-up to the invasion in early 2022, and what you saw as the evolution of Europe's realization that this was about to be a land war. You mentioned my previous incarnation as journalist, so I have to be very careful not to mix these two <laughs> roles of a hack and uh, a public servant. Uh, I, I'll do my best. Uh, it came as a surprise to many political leaders also in Europe, I mean the invasion, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the CIA had taken an unprecedented decision to share intel not only with uh, uh, America's closest allies, but also with the public opinion, which is also uh, quite pretty stunning uh, from uh, our perspective. Uh, I think that we are now, uh, after a year of intense hostilities, and everybody was surprised, in, I mean, not everybody, but uh, as I said, many, uh, many politicians were surprised by the mere fact that Russia chose to invade Ukraine. Uh, and then we were also surprised by the mere fact that Russia did not seize Kiev in 72 hours. So I think that we all uh, overestimated Russia's military might before the invasion began. But now we tend to underestimate it. I think Russia can still, and President Putin can still flood the front lines in Ukraine with uh, manpower, hundreds of thousands of new conscripts drafted in all those, you know, remote villages in Siberia. 
without major political consequences for himself and for his uh, uh, closest acolytes in the Kremlin, uh, we are doubtless facing a race against time now in Ukraine, with the Russians mobilizing their forces, regrouping along the front lines in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians awaiting more um, Western-designed, state-of-the-art weaponry. And there is, a, of course, that, uh, um, a recurring issue of uh, the indolence of the European and American industrial base in terms of not only supplying weapons to Ukraine, but also in terms of increasing our own military capabilities in the framework of NATO. That's why, for example, uh, Poland has delivered, for, in, for instance, uh, more than 250 tanks to Ukraine. Uh, which is not a trifling uh, quantity, I would say. Also, countless amounts of uh, ammunition and uh, anti-aircraft systems, and so on and so forth. And we are still waiting for proper backfill or compensation, because we, can, we cannot uh, you know, deplete our own military capabilities endlessly. We are keeping our fingers crossed for Ukraine to win this war, and we believe in Ukraine's <coughs> victory. On the other hand, we have to look at the wider picture, of, uh, of deterrence and, and of our military preparedness for an eventual major conflagration uh, in this part of Europe. And on the final note, uh, I would like to stress one important uh, development, namely Poland has been perceived until recently as a net recipient of security. Now we are trying to transition to a new role of net provider of security, not only because not, not because we do not believe in the sacrosanct character of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. Uh, President Biden, by the way, has uh, uh, stressed on numerous occasions that uh, we are ready to defend every inch of NATO territory. Uh, but um, on the contrary, we do believe that this is our obligation and it should be our firm commitment, not only in political but also and predominantly in military terms, to increase our military capabilities to provide security to other countries. So we are, not, we are now ready not only to defend Warsaw or Prague, our uh, immediate neighbors in Central Europe, we are ready to defend Berlin, we are ready to defend Paris, and Helsinki, uh, of course. So I think this is the, uh, we are going to increase our military budget up to 4% of our GDP in a few years' time, which is also unprecedented and quite an achievement. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, without uh, social and political burden, but I think that uh, this is something, um, I'm not saying that Poland is a model to follow, although I'm saying this, actually, <laughs> uh, for other countries in Europe which have somehow neglected their uh, commitments in this uh, respect. So, from net recipient to net provider, this is a motto, uh, which we try to adhere to nowadays. Well, in true journalistic style, you have provided a perfect chapeau to everything we want to talk about <laughs> in the rest of this session. I appreciate that. Uh, first, I want to turn to you, Admiral, and ask you basically the same question. How did you see the evolution in your own country? Uh, London has been extremely forward-leaning in supporting Ukraine from the very beginning. Uh, how has the UK played that leadership role? Um, thanks, Emily. Um, so we, obviously what we saw happening in late 2021, we'd kind of seen that happening in, in around Easter 2021 when we saw Russian forces from the central military district, eastern military district starting to build um, around Ukraine's borders and into Crimea. But at that stage, we didn't really see the intent. We saw the capability building in terms of the equipment and, and, the, and the people, but there was no real evidence at that point of intent. And then, from October onwards, we saw some worrying things um, that we and the US shared with some of our European allies that uh, this was more than just a demonstration of force. It took some persuading for people to actually get there, and it was a lot of leadership from the US and the UK bringing in other Western leaders to say, look, this is a thing. This is, this is going to happen. It's not a case of uh, if, it's a case of when. So we decided um, to start delivering lethal aid for the first time. And you'll remember the, the end laws, the, the new generation light anti-tank weapons <clears throat> that arrived in um, early 2022. Obviously, the US had been providing other anti-tank weapons for some time by then. But we decided uh, that, to use an expression, you, you, you can't fatten up a pig on market day. 
and that we needed to make Ukraine strong before the war, shooting war started. So that is the role that we started playing. We were, we'd already been there um, for seven years doing the training. So we'd had, had a succession of training along with our Canadian, Lithuanian, Polish, uh, and US partners. Uh, and then we, we were doubling down on that. And <clears throat> it was very eerie being in Kyiv in, in uh, February uh, because it was like watching um, a train coming towards you and you, you were on the crossing and you'd flooded the engine and you saw this coming towards you and you couldn't do anything about it because you knew it was going to happen. But deep down, no one believed it would happen because I think what happened on the 24th of February was one of the biggest strategic miscalculations we've seen for decades. If you'd looked in Putin's office the night before on his whiteboard, it would have been Nord Stream 2 coming on stream later in the year, tick. The ability to split NATO because of different approaches to trying to secure a peace, tick. The ability to uh, split the US, the Canadians, uh, and the UK away from Ukraine because by, that, by the night before the, that, that happened, the US um, and the Canadians and many other allies were no longer in Ukraine. So all, all, all of this, uh, no sanctions, you know, tick, tick, tick. But he's, he's, he went and, and undid that. Uh, and as, you, as we heard, you know, we've now got Finland uh, in NATO. So Russia has basically just doubled its border with NATO overnight um, because of what it did. Um, and for my final point is that even the Ukrainians could not believe that something so significant would happen. And I remember in late January speaking to a Ukrainian official down in Odessa, and I took him aside and I said, they're coming for you. They are coming to decapitate your government. You know, they're going to come to an airport. And he got very cross with me. He says, you and the US have got to stop saying this because it's harming our economy. And I said, no, no, it, it's happening. Um, so, you know, there was a denial in a lot of levels because such a strategic miscalculation. Absolutely. Um, I want to get back to a lot of those points, in particular the, up until the last minute, the idea that what we were focused on was the economy, not the, the impending storm. Um, John, I want to turn to you next and talk about this intelligence sharing piece. There was unprecedented declassification and discussion of the information that the U.S. and the U.K. had in the run-up to the conflict to try to um, potentially dissuade Putin, which did not work and probably was never going to work, uh, but then more importantly to try to get all of the European allies on sides and unified in the face of what was about to be just dramatic aggression against Russia's neighbor. Um, what were you thinking when you saw these releases of intelligence? I mean, I know my reaction as a former intelligence officer was like, ah, oh no, what are we going to lose for, for giving this away? Um, but then working through my own mind and in previous discussions I've been involved in on the, the pros and cons of releasing intelligence like that. You know that you're probably going to lose some sources, you're probably going to lose some accesses, but on the other hand, if it could have the huge benefit of averting a war or of unifying a continent to protest that war, then it's worth it. What was going through your mind? Well, I, actually, the release of intelligence or the sharing of intelligence uh, in a way that an adversary understands it and sees it is not a new thing. The, the new thing here is the, uh, the volume and the accuracy of this intelligence. Uh, I'm thinking back to my own career. I had been sent to Russia a number of times to, with documents that, that said at the top, uh, secret releasable Russia. In other words, they had been what we would call sanitized to the point where the, the objective is to share with someone what you know, but not to share how you know it. And uh, the, the striking thing in this case was the volume of it. As it turned out, I had been asked, uh, pulled back into government for a short period of time to do a study for the DNI around this period uh, before the war. And I began hearing uh, these indications of this intelligence probably around November. And uh, my first reaction was, as with all intelligence, is that really accurate? You know, intelligence is good, but it's not always exactly right. Um, and I think uh, the reaction that uh, I was having and that many Europeans were having was uh, simply that we thought, most people thought, this kind of thing was was over. Um, I remember being uh, with students from across uh, my school in Sicily in uh, about 
eight, nine years ago, we were studying the battles of World War II there, and um, a military historian was with us, and he said to me, do, do you think we'll ever see this sort of thing again, that is, battles like this between <coughs> major countries over territory? And we talked about it for a minute, and both of us said, we're probably past that. We're probably into another era. So I think that's what happened here. This was such a shock to people that a large country could uh, invade another sovereign country uh, blatantly and without provocation. So uh, that, that was my reaction to the intelligence. And uh, basically, I think it was a good idea. I don't, the, there's also a, a hidden advantage to this. And that is, when you release this kind of information, the other side has to wonder, since you're not telling them, where did that come from? And it can cause them to go into a kind of paroxysm of counterintelligence investigations, which is uh, always good to, you know, take some steam out of them for a while. So there's all sorts of things going on in an intelligence release. Yeah, I do love a good internal mole hunt for distracting the enemy. <laughs> uh, one thing that's very different about this particular conflict is that it really is the first open source war. Uh, we have seen, because so many people on the ground are serving as collectors in a sense and posting everything they have on Twitter or on VK or, or wherever, uh, there's a huge amount of information just out there for the taking. Now, of course the question is, is it legitimate information? How much of it is, is doctored or how much of it is, uh, is real? So, as you have seen through your 30-year career in intelligence work, what do you see this trend line being? Is, is there a move towards further open source intelligence, greater exploitation of open source intelligence? Well, if you just look at this war, uh, there are many examples of the, the power of what we now call open source intelligence. Uh, you can go online and you can see, courtesy of uh, the New York Times or the New York Times Visual Investigation Unit or some other comparable organization, uh, transcripts along with the, uh, the audio of Russian soldiers talking to each other on their radios or cell phones. And you can trace their operations, you can uh, understand their shortage of ammunition, you can hear the fear in their voices. Uh, so there's, that's just one example. Add to that the uh, availability of commercial imagery, which is now carried out uh, through small satellites that are uh, launched quickly and last for not as long as the big satellites that you and I would remember that you know last for 10 or 12 years up there, but which uh, photograph things quickly and with great resolution and uh, are easily available to media outlets and to CSIS, which has done some pioneering work with open source intelligence on things like um, the, uh, the new uh, 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 silos and missile uh, ICBM constructions underway in China and so forth. So this is a new factor in the intelligence world and it's playing a big role in Ukraine. Yeah, I think this is going to be the, the continuing trend going forward. Uh, a brief addition to that, yes, if please. you don't mind. I think it's also important and of, of, uh, of fundamental importance actually in terms of uh, uh, collecting evidence and documenting war crimes yes. committed by Russian troops in in Ukraine. All that, you know, the uh which has which uh, has grown so fast in the course of the war. Uh, we are flooded by information, but on the other hand, it's much easier for us today to collect evidence of unspeakable atrocities uh, committed in Ukraine since the beginning of the invasion. Once again, imagery from space can allow you to coordinate what you're hearing from witnesses who testify to something to what you are seeing and archiving with photographs. So to the ambassador's point. Right, without having to declassify anything. It's all already there. Yeah. Uh, we held an event here last week on content provenance and how you can attempt to prove that an image taken is actually what was happening in the image. And you can trace the entire chain of custody of that image from the person who took it all the way to when it landed on your desktop. We were working with uh, C2PA, which is a, a coalition of companies that are trying to construct technology that would actually let you trace that line of custody. And one of the things that we talked about extensively is being able to use it for war crimes trials and prove its existence and truth. 
Uh, I want to remind our audience in the room that the QR code to ask questions is on the agenda on the table. So if you click that, you can send me a question. I'll pick it up on the iPad here. And for online guests, there is a link to the question form on the web page. So we look forward to receiving your questions. We'll turn to those in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I want to go back to you, Mr. Ambassador, and talk about this role of Poland as a logistics hub. I mean, aid has poured into Ukraine in every form from all over the world, uh, and Poland has done, I think, a masterful job in trying to um, manage it and get it across the border securely. Can you talk a little bit about how you see that role and what lessons you've learned as a frontline state? Well, I chatted with the Admiral just before this session, and I told him that uh, uh, um, whereas uh, the Ukrainian army is now one of the best prepared uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, its uh, military skills and preparation. Uh, Poland uh, has acquired such an expertise in terms of log logistics, uh, absolutely unprecedented in the NATO's uh, history. Um, so uh, I think that uh, I don't know where we would be without Poland as a logistical hub for all those deliveries that uh, uh, somehow had to pass through Poland. Uh, since the beginning of the Russian, uh, of the Russian offensive in, in um, Ukraine. Uh, but again, we, um, contrary to conventional wisdom, we were always very well organized, and we were also uh, very, uh, very adamant and insistent on the necessity of coordinating all our efforts with our NATO and EU allies. And I will just remind you that incident which... Uh, occurred uh, a few months ago when um, uh, a Ukrainian trail missile fell on Polish soil, two casualties, a tragic event. Uh, and of course, it, uh, those were uh, two very stressful hours in my diplomatic career um, as well, because I didn't know how my government would react uh, with uh, you know, that little information we had about what had really happened. Uh, on that uh, on that day, and then it turned out that it was a, 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 the perfect coordination with Washington, with London, with Berlin, which allowed us to uh, to hold the horses and to not not, not to react uh, hastily and prematurely. So it was um, ultimate proof of our maturity, as well as a NATO uh, member. So I think that our uh, credibility. Uh, uh, was bolstered quite significantly uh, on that particular day. So it's not only about logistics, but it's also about uh, political coordination within the framework of, of uh, NATO. Absolutely. That restraint and good judgment, I think, marked that incident. Can I just come in there, Emily? Um, so I remember back in Western Ukraine in, in late February remarking to someone, it's going to be a battle of logistics. It's going to be Western logistics against Russian logistics, because ultimately it's logistics and command and control um, that win wars. And then having been in Zhezhev and seeing the scale of effort and coordination that was it's going on. perfect pronunciation. <laughs> um, <laughs> learned over many cocktails there as well. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it was, it was the coordination. I'd go to the morning meetings and you'd have many countries, not just European countries, in the room talking about aircraft coming in, talking about what was on those aircraft, talking about how it was going to be unloaded. You know, the le that level of detailed logistics was incredibly um, I impressive, speaking as a non-logistician. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, so, speaking of frontline states, Finland. Welcome, Finland. Super happy about that. What are the implications of Finland joining the alliance in your view, and what advice would you give them now that they're part of this exclusive club? Um, so it's fantastic news, and we, just, we only hope that Sweden follows suit um, mm -hmm. in the near future. I mean, Finland has got a lot to teach us because of, you know, they've been staring the Russians and before that the Soviets in the eye um, for a long time and managing that relationship really carefully. So um, applying a careful balance of deterrence um, and not provoking because of being where they were as an, uh, you know, almost as um, isolated in that respect. But what they can teach us, is, and, and as a lot of the Baltic states and Poland can teach us, is about total defense. Mm -hmm. And it's when push comes to shove, you can mobilize very quickly all parts of society. Because 
we've still got that threat in Eastern Europe. Whilst the war at the moment is contained to Ukraine, you know, we can't guarantee that there will be another strategic miscalculation by Putin. So it's learning how we um, mobilize everyone very quickly so that you can stop any further um, invasion into, into Eastern Europe. I mean, you know, today we've got Putin meeting with Lukashenko in, in, in Moscow, and, you know, who knows what, what Belarus might do. They've already kind of been weaponizing immigration, whilst Russia have been weaponizing um, uh, energy. Um, so I think the threat is not just to Ukraine, the threat is to the Baltic states and to the Nordic states still. So that's where we have a lot to learn. And, and I've, 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 you know, been to Finland, I've seen the Finnish Armed Forces, they are hugely proficient, hugely professional, well drilled, so you know, a much welcome addition to NATO. And of course there's the political aspect as well, so you know, NATO is not just you know, all about military, it's a political alliance. So I think it's a massive step. And I go back to that thing, you know, Putin's whiteboard. There was no mention of Sweden or Finland joining NATO at that point. You know, and if you'd said in Feb early February 2022 that some 14 months later, Finland were going to be a member of NATO, no one would have believed you. Right. More evidence about the strategic blunder. You know, Please. I think sometimes the symbolism of, of an event <coughs> in international affairs is as important as the fact of the event. And sim Finland just carries a symbolic meaning that exceeds the size of the country um, or the fact that it has joined. Uh, its whole history in the Cold War, as uh, Dr. Hamry pointed out, is one that resonates strongly uh, in Russia and with us, I think. Uh, also, there's, it's, its adherence to NATO, and I'm convinced Sweden will come in. I'm, I'm convinced the problems with Turkey will be worked out. Uh, when you add Sweden and Finland, there aren't many EU members left who are not in NATO. That's sort of a hidden uh, consequence of what's happening. Uh, I would expect that the, uh, the talk that we've heard for many years about strategic autonomy and so forth within the EU, that that talk will die down because the overlap now, I think, the, I think it comes down to maybe once Sweden is in, it's only Cyprus, Austria, Malta, and one other who are Ireland, Ireland who are not uh, among EU members who are not in, in NATO. So uh, that, that's uh, kind of a hidden, not yet fully digested implication of what's going on here. And as a European analyst said recently, in, in a way what's happening is that the three tribes of Europe uh, are, if not uniting, there is a great, there's much more uniformity among what this analyst called the three tribes of Europe, meaning Southern Europe, where the, the threat has been, prior to this, felt mostly from immigration. Western Europe, many of those countries thought they were living in eternal peace, and the frontline states, which have felt existentially threatened all along, uh, those distinctions are not as uh, sharp as they once were. So you have Europe really coming together politically, and in terms of its understanding of threat, that's something with just enormous consequence in terms of the uh, international system. I think we have all realized in the recent months how important the Baltic Sea is in terms of our energy security, especially from Europe's perspective, which is one of the most crucial components of the uh, overall security architecture uh, in our uh, continent. So uh, Finland's accession is, uh, is pretty vital also for in, uh, with this, uh, in this regard. Um, the Kaliningrad enclave, just across the Baltic Sea from Finland, uh, which is uh, uh, basically a huge military base, or an unsinkable aircraft carrier, uh, still posing an existential threat to not only to Poland, but I think to the, to the whole region. So again, Finland's membership in NATO is also pretty important uh, from this particular perspective. And uh, thirdly, uh, Finland was attacked by the Soviet Union in 1940, the Winter War. Uh, so they know, they remember mentally, but also physically, how unpredictable Russia is as neighbor. Uh, so I think that also in terms of our mental approach to Russia's threat to whole Europe, it's also important to have 
Finland uh, in our camp. Exactly. The Winter War was the first book I pulled out in February of 2022 um, to learn, learn some, relearn some of the lessons. Uh, so on this point about the, the strength of Europe and the newfound unity in European purpose, how do we keep that momentum going? Uh, the energy question, I think, is a vitally important one. And I, for one, have been really impressed to see how Europe has adjusted to exceedingly high energy prices and, and sort of adjusted their strategy to compensate. What do you see as the future of the next winter through Europe? How do you see this momentum building? Ask the weather forecasters. <laughs> <laughs> we did have an exceptionally <coughs> mild winter last year. Which... No, just very, very briefly, uh, Poland has been prescient. Uh, from the outset that Putin would one day use energy as a weapon, which he did at the peak of, this, uh, of the current war in, in Ukraine. So, for example, we inaugurated our first LNG terminal six years ago, almost seven. Uh, last year, we opened the so-called Baltic Pipe, which now transfers gas from the uh, Norwegian continental shelf via Denmark to the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast. And since October last year, we have been entirely independent of imports of Russian gas, which is also quite an accomplishment, not also in the political, not also in the economic, but also in, in political terms. We are now transitioning from coal to gas to nuclear. So again, energy security from our perspective is of uh, utmost uh, importance. Uh, this has been a very painful lesson, not only for us, but also for uh, our partners in Europe. I, I, it was hilarious to hear some uh, political leaders in Western Europe complaining about their constituents' apprehensions uh, that uh, they would have, for example, to lower the temperature in their swimming pools by one degree Celsius during harsh winter. Fortunately, harsh winter did not materialize. But, uh, of course, it's very hard to predict what, uh, what comes next. And, um, uh, but I think that also mentally, for example, in, 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 in Germany's case, it was a very interesting development and a very intriguing phenomenon to see Germany, for example, reducing its reliance on imports of Russian gas from roughly 55, 60% to virtually zero. Yeah. So it was possible in spite of all those fears that, uh, uh, that you know, have accumulated for so many years in Germany. You know, Europe deserves a lot of credit here because here in the United States we didn't really have to sacrifice uh, for this, except perhaps gas prices. Um, and they were spared that terrible winter that could have occurred, but nonetheless uh, I think deserves a lot of credit. Now it's going to get harder uh, because OPEC has uh, just cut production again. And uh, this will benefit the Russians. They will gain uh, an enormous amount of money from the fact that oil prices are now projected to go up from around $75 a barrel for crude. Now, as high as $95 uh, dollars, uh, this year, and then uh, perhaps ascend to over $100 in 2024. So uh, we're not out of the energy crisis yet in, in terms of uh, this war and its implications. I mean, oil is always sort of the X factor in uh, international affairs, and uh, Europe's done very well up till now, uh, but uh, I think harder times could be coming if we have a bad winter. Do you have a sense for the health of the Russian economy overall? There's been uh, some reporting that its economy is not shrinking as much as expected over the course of the last year, but that it is shrinking somewhat. The Economist had an article recently saying projecting, I think, 2% growth in the Russian economy. Um, but it's very hard to get good numbers out of Russia. So what sorts of things would you be looking for to see whether their economy is hurting because of this? Well, the number, it's very hard to get good numbers, as you say. So uh, I think... Um, it's easier to get bad numbers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to get uh, official numbers. Uh, what it is. Actually, there was a time, I, I, I haven't been in Russia since 2018, there was a time then when you could get a serious statement from their uh, economic officials about their economic situation. You really can't get that now. Uh, sanctions have to be hurting them, but they're expert at eluding sanctions. Uh, the fact that they're working so closely with Iran and China, I think, will help them uh, economically. 
So I wouldn't count on economic stress being uh, the, you know, the critical factor that we assumed it would be at the beginning of the war with sanctions. And, you know, the, the problem with our policy is always that sanctions is our default mm -hmm. a response to almost everything. Um, uh, it, it's, it's one weapon we can easily invoke, but um, uh, I, I'm not thinking this is uh, a killer for the Russians at this point. I think what's going to affect them as much as the sanctions, and we should, should obviously be putting sanctions on all the cronies and, and all the companies and all the rest of it, it's been the migration of the labor force. You know, mm -hmm. the Russians have lost so many um, skilled labor, either avoiding conscription or because they're just not going to put up with what they're seeing as in increasing um, totalitarianism and oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's going to bite in the long term because, because they're going to get the, they're, they're having a brain drain. Mm -hmm. People voting with their feet if they can't vote actually. Yeah, I've always <clears throat> felt that, you know, again, you know, Ru the, the Russia that we knew prior to this war uh, was a Russia in which uh, people liked to travel abroad, they liked to send their children abroad, mm -hmm. uh, they had a lot of money to spend, they were integrating into the world in a way. And I think more than sanctions itself, more than the availability of specific goods, in Russia, I think the thing that is most painful to them, yeah. those who have remained, and uh, and many of course have left, but for those who have remained, it's the um, inability to move about freely in the world and to participate in the world in the way that Russia had become accustomed to doing. And this is one of the things, going back to Putin's whiteboard, that Putin threw away with this war. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that, uh, I mean, Back uh, a year ago, uh, I, I wrote my first piece on this, I made the point that uh, Putin will be a pariah mm -hmm. and will ultimately be accused of war crimes. Now, I have to think that the people around him, his closest associates, are thinking, well, me too, maybe? So there has to be, even though it's hard to see, there has to be some kind of pressure building inside of Russia to either stop this war or to change the situation in a way that would once again take Russia back uh, to where it was before Putin threw it all away. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, the Russian economy and the Russian society are extraordinarily resilient, uh, have always been. And uh, I, I should not be even saying that as a diplomat, but um, <laughs> With all due respect, they can survive on, on cabbage and potatoes mm. for many years. I do believe that they will finally, they will eventually feel the pinch of sanctions, but it will take some time. It's always a very arduous process. We can, uh, we, we can you know, recall the example of Iran, of Cuba. Uh, it's never like this. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there are so many the, the, the social inequalities in Russia, which paradoxically, help them survive this crisis because people who have always lived well, they still enjoy good life and comfortable life, be it in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, or in Dubai, or in Istanbul. And all those who have lived in object poverty uh, up to now, they still do. In, again, in all those you know, remote villages in Siberia. So. Uh, Sanctions for them are completely irrelevant because they, they, they don't change uh, either positively or negatively their day-to-day um, -day existence. So I think that uh, it, it's also important to not to look at the Russian economy and the, the, the Russian and the foundations of the Russian society through the prism of uh, our own European uh, uh, views. Um, finally, I think that uh, what we have seen now with uh, uh, Europe reducing its uh, dependence on imports of Russian raw materials, how irrelevant, uh, how unimportant Russia is actually in terms of the global economic bloodstream. You exclude oil and gas, and Russia has nothing to offer actually. And you are absolutely right that uh, the only, uh, there are a few countries which, which do help, it's like an, you know, um, uh, an IV trip for Russia today. Mm. China purchasing uh, humongous amounts of Russian gas and oil, 
India as well, yeah. unfortunately. So I think that uh, when that ends, uh, Russia's role in the, in the global economic constellation, if you will, will be uh, absolutely naked. And we'll see in plain view how uh, weak and how unimportant Russia is, quite interestingly, for, uh, for the, the, you know, the global picture. But picking up on the ambassador's comments, though, uh, absolutely correct that there is this division in Russia between St. Petersburg, Moscow, and everyone else. That said, uh, Putin's war has broken the social contract with the elites in Russia. Mm -hmm because uh, if you talk to people in influential positions in Petersburg or Moscow, uh, something commonly said when I've been there is, here's the social contract. Stay out of politics and you can have a nice life. And really, life was very nice for the elites in Russia or for people living in those two cities at least and some of the other large cities. <coughs> life is not so nice now and so, that's something we can't gauge at this point, certainly I can't, the effect of what I, I think is breaking that social contract with those in Russia who are most important uh, to Putin's survival and his uh, the stability of his regime. Um, a contact in, uh, in Gimo, in, um, um, in Moscow, told me um, at the start of the war, 95% of the Siloviki, so all the sort of securocrats, were in favor of the war. 70% um, of the businessmen were in favor. After one week, that, uh, that had flipped for the businessmen, so only 30% were in favor because they could see what was happening. And even the Siloviki had gone down to about 70-30. So there was a definite realization within the first week of the war <clears throat> that, that this was not going well, that there had been this miscalculation, um, Putin had underestimated the cohesion and the solidarity of Europe and the West. He had definitely underestimated the, the Ukrainian army. And so they, those societal tensions, as you say, they will play out and we will see what that, that, that means over time. But <clears throat> when you look at stampedes at IKEA in Omsk on its last day before being shut, you can see that there was definite an impact that, that sanctions were having. It's quite the, quite the sentence, stampede at IKEA in Omsk. It's a lot of geopolitics and uh, economics wrapped into one sentence. <laughs> um, I mean, it is true, the, the, the Russian oligarchs are all cut off from their yachts and their penthouses in London at the moment. And every time you see a, some kind of hint in the press that an oligarch is coming out and criticizing Putin, it's like the new Kremlinology. You know, who, who, is, who is perhaps turning their back on the Kremlin? Mm. Were you going to add something there? No, 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 just absolutely. You know, and, and the children of um, oligarchs not going to their finishing schools. Indeed, it's a tragedy. Well, you, you know, we know that a spring offensive is, is planned. A, a lot hinges on that spring offensive that the Ukrainians are going, or will mount. We, we cannot yet, at, I, I certainly cannot at this point gauge how it's going to go. Um, great shortage of 155 millimeter ammunition, uh, that has to be pushed in and many other things. High Mars are going, tanks are going, but we don't know how that's going to go. But a knockout blow uh, on the Russian military in that offensive could have a, a ripple effect in Russia that is hard to calculate at this point. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, we're entering a period where Russia is even less predictable internally than it has always been. And we should be prepared for surprises. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. So on that note, I'm going to turn to some audience questions. Um, one person asked about the theory of victory in the Russia-Ukraine war. So what does victory look like for the Ukrainians, in your view? Um, so, I mean, you talk about a, a spring offensive and being able to perhaps cut that land bridge to um, Crimea. Um, I think victory is not just about the military lever. Um, because at some stage we need the diplomatics community and, and everyone else to come in and start looking at actually what does a peace settlement look like. So I just think we need to be careful when we start talking about victory. You know, there needs to be conditions by which both sides end up going to the negotiating table and I don't think we're there yet. 
the, the, certainly the Russians keep just ploughing people into Volgodar, Bakhmut, Avdivka, so they're sort of certainly showing no sign that they're, they're ready to negotiate. I think it would be suicide for Zelensky um, to negotiate now. So this is where we just need the diplomats to come together and work out actually what is, what is the um, equation that allows us, both sides, uh, to come to a solution on this. Because, yeah, we're going to see the military play out and the Ukrainians might score some tactical and operational successes, but ultimately, strategic success is going to be with a diplomatic lever thrown in. I don't believe in a diplomatic solution, not after all those atrocities, again, uh, committed by Russian troops in Ukraine. It, it would be like negotiating with Hitler in April 1945. Uh, I do believe in Ukraine's uh, military victory, but uh, quite frankly, everything boils down to what will happen with Crimea. This is, I think, the, 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 the most important uh, um, element of this whole equation. Uh, Russians are probably pretty much concerned about uh, uh, the Ukrainian government's uh, designs in this uh, respect, and I think that uh, the, the most pure definition of Ukraine's victory would be to have their borders back. Uh, all those territories attacked, invaded, and uh, annexed and occupied since 2014. Yeah. As simple as that. that that's, uh, as the ambassador described it, is the way I would define it as well. Have the borders back to where they were before 2014, Crimea being the big problem. How you deal with Crimea is... Uh, I think we'll, if you get to that point, that will be the major diplomatic challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hesitate to even suggest a solution. I've seen people talk about maybe you need to have a referendum there, an internationally supervised referendum. Uh, the Crimea, you know, obviously the Ukrainians want it back, but that I think will be uh, the, the sticking point. And then we have to think about if, if that is a victory. And I, I, again, I agree with the ambassador that up to the point when we until we, once we learned how the Russians were conducting this war um, <coughs> with what are now universally accepted as war crimes, I could see that a negotiated solution could be possible. But once that, once we've crossed that bridge, I can't imagine the Ukrainians settling for anything uh, other than what the ambassador has described. Then we have to think about, well, what happens after that? Mm -hmm. Russia is still under sanctions. Uh, how do they get from un, out from under sanctions? Where does the money come to, from to rebuild Ukraine? Presumably Russia will then have reparations or the billions that we've sequestered that are you know, off limits for the Russians now can be devoted to that. So there's a kind of a bleak and dispirited future for Russia, I think, in any uh, aftermath of this that I can see. I mean, I, I, I um, have the utmost admiration for my Ukrainian friends in the armed forces of Ukraine, the ability to withstand what they've been, you know, well, throughout the whole 14 months, but especially um, the start of this year where the Russians have just been throwing conscript after conscript, equipment after equipment into, the, into that eastern line. Um, but the thought of, and, and I'd, I'd love to have my optimism bias switched up to 11 that says, that the Ukrainians will be able to expel them from all parts of Lugansk, Donetsk, Saporizhia, Kherson. I, th I think Crimea has got to be a political solution because of just the, the concentration of force that is there and what it would mean for the Ukrainians to go in there. The Ukrainians have been amazing, but they still haven't demonstrated kind of that air land integration that, uh, that, that NATO forces um, would show. So in any forthcoming spring offensive, you know, even that tactical operational success will be a bit met by further Russian escalation. You know, this, this Putin's neurotic when it comes to Ukraine. You know, if, if it, you know it's his July 21 um, essay going back to the 1922 borders, if it's his speech last year that talks about the Great Northern War that went on for 21 years in 1700 onwards, you know, he's in this for the long term. So, uh, you know, to say that I don't think there's going to be a very quick military solution, I'd love to be wrong, but I'm afraid I'm just looking at it through what we're seeing in terms of a war attrition at the moment. Hence, we just need to be seeing what are favorable conditions for Ukraine to negotiate. And I think the Ukrainians would be up for that, notwithstanding some of the horrors that we saw at Irpin and Bucha and in Mariupol and in Sumy. It's been a long-standing tradition in Tsarist, Bolshevik, Soviet and, and Russian Russia 
to perceive uh, other nations in Europe as uh, irrelevant, unimportant. We know something about that, by the way. We the polls. So it's, uh, as you said, it's, uh, so Ukraine is absolutely an, an, uh, an undescribable, uh, jarring element in Putin's uh, mindset. So he can't even, he can't afford to lose this war because it is his uh, you know, political uh, and also, if you will, psychological priority mm -hmm. to crush the Ukrainians. By the way, it is also one of his many accomplishments that the Admiral mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, it's not only about reinvigorating NATO, it's not only about enlarging this organization, but also about strengthening the Ukrainian national identity. Quite. That is absolutely incredible. I think before the war, very few people here in America knew what the Ukrainian colors looked like. <laughs> now you can see Ukrainian flags uh, basically everywhere. Nobody knew what, what, uh, what the name of the Ukrainian president was. Now everybody knows Zelensky. So um, that's, that's also pretty interesting. Yeah, we had a joke that basically Putin's done more for Ukrainian nationalism than Stepan Bandera did in the sort of 40s and 50s. <laughs> and you know, the, you're seeing more black and red band banderista flags now. You know. Although there, there was a generational change in, in uh, Ukraine that was impressive. Putin sort of put the frosting on this with the war, but prior to the war, if you went to Ukraine, uh, you realized there was a new generation of people who were not just patriotic, but st determined to stamp out corruption, determined to bring a democracy there, to, to polish their democracy. I had a young uh, member of parliament say to me, you know, here's the, here's the danger we face. This is before the war. Ukraine is the only country that can change Russia. Hmm. What she meant was, the Russians don't think of us as, they think of us as their little brothers, little sisters. Mm -hmm. If we have a functioning, transparent, prosperous democracy here, Putin knows that his citizens will want the same thing. If we can have that, mm -hmm. I actually think that's, I, I think that's a bigger driver for Putin than worries about NATO. He knows NATO is not going to attack Russia, but Putin but he knows that Ukraine can change Russia. You know why, why Bucha was attacked in the first place? Because it was, uh, and it still is, a posh neighborhood. Mm. It was a symbol. Mm -hmm. The crushing and destroying a symbol of Ukraine's uh, growing prosperity. Yeah, they were determined very much so in the Maidan to, to look west yeah. and to tie Ukraine closer to Europe. And I do think that uh, what was probably going through Putin's mind at the time was something along the lines of how dare they. I'm, I am concerned that this will be a long-term war. And as you pointed out, the ability of the Russians to put up with pain, the commitment of the Ukrainians to fulfilling what they see as getting their, all of their territory back into having a whole Ukraine and, and Russia kicked out. Um, and then you have uh, NATO and, and Europe and America that are eager to see um, Russia pushed back where they are now as opposed to making trouble later on. And the question of you know, what is a sustainable end to the fight, I think, is going to be one of those friction points in Europe that I, I am concerned about, perhaps causing some friction in the alliance. Um, but I have been very pleasantly surprised to see us work through those thus far um, and hope that that can certainly continue. Uh, one more question from the audience. I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, a couple people asking about the Russia-China relationship. Um, Felicia Schwartz from Financial Times asks, have you seen any change in, in China's willingness to provide weapons to Russia after the Xi Putin meeting? Is China trying to find the red lines that would trigger a Western response? Who wants to take that one on? Well, <clears throat> this was another case where, and I don't know this for a fact, but I assume the a comment by the U.S. government saying there are indications <clears throat> that uh, Russia is, or that China is considering lethal aid. I assume, without knowing, that that was uh, something drawn from an intelligence report. So it's another case where intelligence was used to perhaps discourage that. I, you know, I think China is still walking a fine line here. Uh, I know the, the Xi uh, Putin visit seemed to go well and got a lot of publicity and they seem to be on the same page on many issues. 
At the same time, China really needs Europe, and Europe wants to maintain a relationship with China, so they've got to be careful not to. And if you look at the public opinion polls in Europe, uh, China is not well regarded now among most countries. I mean, the disapproval of China is somewhere between 34% and 90%, depending on whether you're polling in the east or in the center. <clears throat> so it, it's a fine line that China has to walk here. One possible advantage of China and Russia um, working together, if you can imagine an advantage, is that I think it diminishes the likelihood of Putin actually using nuclear weapons in this conflict mm. <clears throat> because China has a <coughs> no first use policy. And if Putin were to use nuclear weapons, China would have to condemn it. I can't imagine that China could do anything other than strongly condemn it. So in a sense, uh, Xi's embrace of Putin may discourage that, uh, that, that uh, tendency of Putin to think about it even. In order to grow and to increase its international clout, uh, China needs economic stability worldwide. If you look, for example, at the map of Europe and all those post-Soviet republics in Central Asia, this is where Belt and Road runs. So uh, the more unstable the situation in that region, the more concerned the Chinese leadership will be. And again, the more uh, uh, the worse the economic, the, the global economic situation, uh, the less inclined China will be to uh, prolong this war. Yeah, I mean, China's foreign policy is governed by the need for internal stability. So it's all about um, GDP growth so that you can continue to feed a, a burgeoning and growing middle class. Anything that harms that um, in, um, means uh, that you don't go down that foreign policy route. So I think the calling out of don't you do this because we will sanction you was very apt um, and, and China would listen to that. In terms of the Xi Putin link, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you've effectively got Moscow now being a vassal to Beijing in the same way Minsk is to Moscow. Uh, and I think that's more and more telling. And, and at the same time, China are benefiting from discounted hydrocarbons. Right, exactly. So, you know, which is good for internal stability. Mm -hmm. That's quite the chain from Belarus to yeah. Moscow to Beijing. Um, yeah, anything else anybody to add on the China relationship? We could go for hours on this one, I know. Well, I would just say that you know, everyone makes a lot of whether we should be pivoting toward Asia or, mm -hmm. and possibly at the risk of neglecting Europe. I, I think that's a bit of an artificial issue. The two things are so connected now. I mean, Japan has, the Japanese prime minister has visited, visited Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, at the same time that Xi was visiting Moscow. So I think in Asia, they're watching this very carefully, not just the Chinese, but our, our partners in Asia, and, um, and we certainly cannot engage effectively in the Indo-Pacific region without a European, what is our force multiplier? Our force multiplier is our alliance structure. Where is our alliance structure centered? In Europe. So I think these two things are connected in ways uh, that are unprecedented in uh, modern times, and I don't think we fully can map that yet. Let me just add to this, this Poland has just signed some very juicy contracts with some South Korean companies, yep. so it's another connection. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so back into Europe continent for a second. There are a few questions about the security of some other European states that are on the periphery, um, talking about the, the Baltics and then also talking about what this means, what Finland's accession to NATO means for Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, uh, to potentially join one day. How do we see the security situation there developing? So we've still got the NATO open door policy. I don't think anything's changed there. I think we may have mismanaged expectations when that was announced, you know, back when it was. Mm. But that still remains NATO policy. Um, you know, it would be great, as, as we heard earlier, that Ukraine would be able to, uh, you know, have accession to NATO and, and Georgia and Moldova. But I, I just think we, need to, we do need to be very careful. There, there is a time and a place for that. 
and we don't want to sleepwalk our way into um, a, a NATO Article 5 situation that we wouldn't, wouldn't want, that would suddenly bring about the thing we don't want. Uh, at the same time, Article 5 is the one thing that worries Putin. Mm. You know, it's, it's the one reason I think that the Baltic states, Poland, Finland, are safe because NATO Article 5 is, is, is the bedrock of our collective security. Um, and um, we need to protect that very carefully. But think about, think about what Europe will be after this war. When, when this war is finally over, Ukraine will be the country in Europe with the greatest experience in war in modern times since World War II. And the frontline states uh, st stretching from the Baltics through Poland and, and south to the, the, the Czech Republic and perhaps even to Bulgaria, we have sent forces to Bulgaria, uh, will be in a way the, uh, how to put it, the, uh, Recipient the heartbeat of, of NATO. Yeah. Ah, yes. The heartbeat of, the heartbeat of NATO. Uh, what does that mean? That, that's a fundamental change in the, what would you call it, the balance of influence, not the balance of power, but the, the, uh, the kind of balance of influence and, and energy in, in the NATO alliance. And how do you keep Ukraine out? How do you logically keep Ukraine out after they've fought a war with Russia? And at, before this war, I think the United States was, you know, hands off that idea of Ukraine and NATO. They knew it was too provocative, but after this war, how do you keep Ukraine out when it is the most experienced country in Europe it, it, in, in what NATO is all about? It has been Russia's flagship policy for years to, to artificially create frozen conflicts in the most immediate neighborhood. We have examples of Moldova, of Georgia, now Ukraine. In order not to allow those countries to get closer to uh, our civilization, to the West, to the free world, also to some very specific political and military organizations and entities like NATO and the European Union. Because again, I do believe uh, that it is my firm conviction that uh, Ukraine's uh, <coughs> membership in the European Union is much more important than Ukraine's accession to NATO. Because uh, Ukraine's prosperity, Ukraine growing economically, effectively cracking down on corruption, and decoupling itself irreversibly from that Soviet uh, sphere of influence, and also from the Soviet mentality, is uh, Mr. Putin's worst nightmare, and primary concern also in terms of his uh, foreign policy. This is an important point. I mean, your, your point about how before the war, the US was a little standoffish because it was, would be provocative. Also, Ukraine had some internal problems with corruption, with highly penetrated services by the Russian intelligence services. There were some actual practical reasons as well. And some of the steps that Zelensky has taken to try to root corruption out of those services, I think, is going to be a, a selling point for a closer tie into the EU and a closer tie into NATO as well. So I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, Readiness. Let's talk about readiness. That will be a good transition into the rest of our day. Where we're going to talk about things like uh, how well prepared NATO is to continue fighting in a long conflict. We had a couple questions about whether or not uh, required military service is going to be a thing for NATO going forward. I suspect the answer is no, but that's an interesting question. What do you see as the, the key elements of NATO readiness when it comes to the European theater? And I'm going to start with you on that one, sir. Um, so I think in terms of readiness, what we've seen a definitely a strengthening of the southeastern and eastern flank since early 2022 because of, um, because of basically egregious actions by, by Russia. Um, uh, it would be very interesting to see what comes out of Vilnius and the commitment of uh, percentage of GDP to defence spending. Because we need, I think we do need to see an increase in, in all of our countries. You know, the UK is just committed to in, uh, increase up to 2.5%. You said, that, I think, 4% for Poland. Um, you know, the US has just announced a massive $842 billion budget for the fourth, forthcoming year. You know, I think we need to see that across the alliance. Um, because that's the way we're going to increase our readiness and our interoperability and our capability um, in the face of very real threats 
um, uh, not just within Europe but across the world. Um, we've also seen sort of the kick-starting of the industrial base. Um, I was at something where um, Bill Laplante was speaking recently and he was describing the, the brilliant way that the US now recognises the need to start producing more stuff so we can increase our own stockpiles, we can increase our own readiness. Uh, and now we've just announced that in the UK as well um, on the back of our integrated review refresh, uh, the need to actually just kickstart industry again because you can't keep providing old for new, uh, new for old to mm. Ukraine. We've got, to still, you know, we've got to generate our own stockpiles. Um, we've got to improve the way we do engineering support. So we're increasing our, our readiness across um, our capabilities, both you know, land, air, sea, and in C5 ISR. So, so there is a lot to do. Um, but I think we're hearing the right noises at the moment that we re recognize amongst the alliance that that's what we must do. And it would be really good when we get to Vilnius that we see that unity of all nations committing to increase their defense budgets. I think it's a mixed picture. I mean, no question NATO's in better shape than it has ever been. On the other hand, I think only about seven countries have actually gone to 2%, and they are the ones you would expect, the frontline states and the UK, and Greece, which is always high because of other issues. Because of Turkey. Uh, because of Turkey, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's an issue. Um, on the other hand, I say mixed picture. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are two new F-35 squadrons in the UK. There are two new destroyers in Rota. There are uh, four, uh, the, the, as you were indicating, uh, the frontline states. There, there are de new deployments to the frontline states, and uh, so I think it's a mixed, it's a mixed picture. Uh, and and also stocks are depleted. So all of those things are issues that can be worked on. They're not unsolvable, but they, are, uh, they require attention. This is something we're going to talk about for the rest of the day, this, the empty bins question. Are we ready to continue fighting in a, a high-tech, high-turnover war when it comes to, to weaponry and equipment? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'll give you the last word. Very concisely. Of course, I, I, I fully agree with the Admiral uh, that uh, the, the industrial military complex is of uh, fundamental importance in terms of our military effort in, in a future hypothetical major conflagration, uh, not only in our part of Europe, but also elsewhere. But I would add another factor to this, namely the, the existing and upcoming cyber threats. We, we haven't mm -hmm. touched upon this issue in our conversation, but I think that we are, if we are unable to effectively uh, safeguard um, our interests and ensure that our critical infrastructure works properly in times of war, uh, then we would have an, uh, uh, quite a serious, uh, we would face quite a serious problem. And uh, last point, I think that one of the very few things Russians excel at nowadays is disinformation. And I think that this, this particular factor has been somehow overlooked by, uh, by NATO and by the European Union, for example, in, uh, we, we are you know, somehow addicted to this uh, Eurocentric view of what is going on in Ukraine and how uh, compromised uh, Russia's reputation is on the international stage. Uh, if we think that we are winning that battle of narratives, we are totally wrong. Uh, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, all those Russian arguments about the, the war and its origins uh, fall on, very, on a very fertile ground. Also because, I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but uh, around 100,000 young people from the so-called third world countries or non-affiliated in the 70s, in the 80s, and also at the beginning of the 90s, just after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, received scholarships in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, they, are, uh, they graduated from uh, Soviet and Russian universities. Now, in the 60s and 70s, they are heads of state, mm -hmm. presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, uh, lawyers, architects, opinion makers, celebrities in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. Uh, <coughs> thousands of them speaking Russian and thousands of them much more vulnerable uh, to Russian propaganda than us. So it is, a, a, again, a, a phenomenon uh, uh, a little bit under the radar, 
but we also have to focus on, on this. If we want to be w well prepared for uh, all those, you know, future confrontations with Russia. There, there is a kind of separation developing between global south and global north. Not quite north-south, but roughly along those lines, as the ambassador uh, suggests. I mean, for countries in Africa and Latin America, the issues that we're talking about here are uh, superseded by other issues that to them are more personally uh, compelling at this moment, coupled with the fact that uh, Russian diplomacy has been uh, pretty effective there, along with Chinese diplomacy. Right. The, the implications of global food supplies based on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I'm not sure why we're not talking about that more. Uh, we do ignore the Global South at our peril, and I think that's going to be a continuing feature of these discussions. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before you all make a run for coffee for our 15-minute break, before our keynote with Seth Jones and Admiral Grady, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, please uh, help me in thanking our panel.
Okay, folks, great. Uh, uh, I hope you felt that set last panel was, was really, it was so interesting, and I'm so glad that you were able to hear it. But in a way, it kind of it builds up to now what is going to be a very important conversation uh, with the vice chairman. Um, you know, I, when, when, I early, when I first started working on the Senate Armed Services Committee it was when we were, they were working on Goldwater Nichols. And uh, there was a huge debate. You know, there was no vice chairman in the past. And there was a desire to have a vice chairman, but the question was, what is his protocol status? And back then there were four services, and so there were having, bringing a vice chairman would add the sixth person in the room, but is the vice chairman number two or is he number six? And we had a raging debate about that um, because, you know, there was an interesting division uh, within the services over the soundness of Goldwater Nichols. Fortunately, we made exactly the right decision. Not me, but the senators and the representatives. And uh, it's because of that, the vice chairman is now such a vital, crucial actor in the system. And um, he is, you know, he's, he's really the chief operating officer, you know, and, and he is every day working all of the tough issues that keep this going forward every day, every day. And uh, we're so lucky to have Admiral Grady in that role. He comes from a, a Navy family. Uh, his dad was in the Navy when he was commissioned. Uh, and of course, he's risen to be, uh, you know, the very pinnacle of service. And uh, it's because of the strength of his character and the quality of his intellect that he's been lifted up to this level. And we're all going to be the beneficiaries of that just now. So let me turn to you, Seth, for a more formal introduction. Admiral Grady, thank you. Delighted to have you here. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamry. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral Grady, for coming. Uh, as everyone is aware, uh, Admiral Grady is the 12th Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, in this capacity, and we're going to talk about that uh, early on. Uh, he's a member of the Joint Chiefs and the nation's second highest ranking uh, military officer. Uh, what I wanted to begin before handing the floor to you is to congratulate you after a tough beginning of the football season yeah. at Notre Dame. Uh, I was there around the Marshall Low uh, on campus and there was clearly a uh, feeling of desperation on campus, but I, the Notre Dame football team responded. Uh, so anyway, congratulations on a, on a good ending of the season and a victorious bowl yeah. game too. Yeah. So. Only as good as your next season though. So That's true, uh, okay. Well, thank you for coming, appreciate it. Um, just wanted to start off really with um, uh, your, your introductory remarks, including framing how you see the job as vice chairman, including your support to the, the chairman. Sure. Um, well, first of all, let me thank, uh, thank CSIS, Dr. Hamry, and you, Dr. Jones, for, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, to exchange ideas. I think what you do here at CSIS is really, really important because it helps, uh, it helps uh, the entire apparatus kind of think through all the tough issues and you help shape that in, uh, in, in many, many ways. So I thank you for that and I, I thank you in advance for continuing uh, to do that. So a little bit about the vice chairmanship. It is a very unique position. I really feel like I stand in the intersection of, uh, or you could look at it as a, as a Venn diagram where in the middle is the vice chairman and it's this intersection of policy, of resourcing, of acquisition and budget. I think unique to the, to the, to the team in the Pentagon, I play in all of those uh, spheres. So, so you can see me as the depth, depth uh, Secretary Hicks, uh, who's spectacular by the way, um, as her best battle buddy, I think, at the DMAG or at the, uh, the Workforce Council. I play at the NSC on the Deputies Committee, um, the co-chair of the Nuclear Weapons Council, certainly in the tank as a member of the, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, of course, that all leads to the JROC. I'll talk about that in a minute, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council and how important that is, back to one of those four worlds that I talked about uh, in terms of uh, the requirements piece. And what you may not know, but what I think is really important, as the 12th Vice Chairman, I am in fact the first for whom it's a four-year job, not a two, and I cannot be the chairman. Right? 
And I think there's power in that, right? And I'm not worried about the next job. Uh, well, maybe after, <laughs> after, uh, after this. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, but I think that gives me a, a little independence to provide that forceful backup to the chairman and the deputy and, uh, uh, and to the secretary. So how do I do that? So I have a strategic framework in my head that I'd like to sketch out for you. If there are three end states that one I think the vice chairman can achieve, the first is joint force overmatch now and in the future. And I think that now and in the future piece is really important because there's this constant tension between current readiness and future readiness. I'll talk a little bit about that later. The second is dominant decision advantage and bringing that uh, to, the, to the department and or particularly to the joint force. To be honest with you, I thought that would be a foundational principle that I could build on when I came to the building. It, it wasn't there. And so I want to use this next three years I have to try to achieve that. Think JADC2 or, or, or how we bring um, data to the, to the foundry as we make decisions for, uh, for the budget process. And then lastly, as we need warriors that can fight and win. That's the people piece. Four lines of effort to get to that. The first is to provide best military advice. I think that makes sense. The next is drive force design and force development. Uh, the third is to data enable the force in the foundry. What is the force in the foundry? I speak about and think about my job through two lenses. The force is the going out and fighting and winning. The foundry is everything that enables it. And back to those four worlds, I think I stand squarely in the middle uh, of all of those. So we talk about how do we data enable the fight, the force, think JADC2, but then how also do I bring data to the foundry to make the best possible decisions we can make from a budgetary uh, perspective. Um, and then the last is to create a culture of excellence that gives us those warriors we have. There are three tenets that I think are foundational across all those lines of effort. Really, really important. First is to support the chairman. I am the vice chairman and it's important for me to carry, particularly as, as a member of the, when I go to the National Security Council, to carry his position forward, but also to provide that forceful backup in private. And uh, we have a great relationship that, uh, that allows me to do that. I also think, secondly, that I have to integrate across three axes. The first axis, I think, is across echelon. So all the way from the Pentagon, all the way down to the deck plate where, uh, where our service members operate. Then you might think of the, the x-axis as across all domains. Really important to, to integrate across all domains. And then the final one, which ties to the third tenant, which is the, is, is, uh, the uh, importance of our allies and partners, is to integrate across all of our allies and partners. Maybe that's the z-axis. And how you define allies and partners, I think, is really important. Certainly within the joint force, uh, with our OSD colleagues, into the interagency, how important is that for a whole government approach, um, out to our allies and partners, many of whom are in uniform. I'm so delighted to see many of them here today and to be such a big part of your, uh, of your seminar over the two days. Um, and then into industry and academia. I think you can see yourself there in that, uh, in that, in that third axis. Um, so we do have this straight line then from the national uh, security strategy to the national defense strategy to the national military strategy. Those are kind of, here's what we want to have done. And then the how is the joint warfighting concept. And we can talk about that later if you wish. We've had 1.0, we finished 2.0. 3.0 was just signed out and briefed to the secretary yesterday. And what's important about this is it will now be transitioned into joint pub one. It will become doctrine. It's the first time that we've been in a position to do that. And I think that's what will drive change within the, within the joint force. The other key element of the joint warfighting concept 3.0 that we just signed out is the linkage to the JROC. And, uh, and that is the concept required capabilities that are explicitly listed in the joint warfighting concept. Those then drive action to the JROC. Let me tell you where I, where I think we are with the, with the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we do there with the vices of, of, of all the services. And there are four things that I think you should know about the JROC. First, building on uh, the shoulders of my predecessors, folks like Sandy Winnefeld or Paul Selva or, or John Hyten, we have gotten away from, hey, bring me your widget and I will approve it in the JROC to here's the requirement Stakeholder, tell me how you're going to fill that requirement. That's a big change, and that's, uh, that is a, a big push, put, putting over of the rudder, if you will, uh, going forward. The next is we have to stop thinking about things in stovepipes, whether it's a system or a capability, but we have to think about it in terms of portfolios. So now we have instituted the concept uh, portfolio management reviews that bring all elements together across a particular challenge set. 
the linkage of that then to what Bill LaPlante and his team are doing in acquisition, in the integrated acquisition portfolio reviews, that's being done now, but not in serial, but in parallel, so we can go faster in the acquisition process. And the final thing, and this is gonna take me three years to do it, is I wanna put teeth into the JROC. We sign out a lot of documents, we say we're gonna do a lot of things, we ask stakeholders to do a lot, are we actually doing those things? Um, and, and to kind of wrap up my uh, prepared remarks, just a note on the center of the universe, and that is our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our marines, and our, and our guardians. You know, the further you get away from the, uh, the waterfront, uh, the harder it is to remember that it's all about the center of the universe and setting them up for success. So on those really hard days, you know, you have to have an image in your head of, well, why am I doing this? And I have my own image. This is the eight-inch gun crew, the USS New York, circa 1898. That's my image, and all I have to do is look up in the wall and go, that's why I'm doing it. So over to you. Great. Uh, well, thank you. You've hit on a couple of themes that we're going to go into a little more detail um, about. I want to take your initial comment on the joint warfighting concept, but bring it to uh, where some of the issues that we're talking about today, which is the war in Ukraine. So from your perspective first, you know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, environments, uh, contested logistics, mm -hmm. uh, long-range fire, right. uh, precision strike. Uh, what are the, as you look at the way the war has transpired in Ukraine, what do you take to be some of the major lessons in war fighting uh, as, as you've been thinking about this from a joint war fighting concept? How, how do you see practically, empirically from what we're seeing in Ukraine, what do you take to be some of the major lessons? Yeah. Um, well, first, the joint warfighting concept. You just hit on what we call the four key battles for advantage. Now, the joint warfighting concept is, uh, is very classified, but I can talk about the four key battles for advantage. Um, and, and those are to achieve information advantage, to maintain command and control in all environments, to conduct long-range fires, and then to be able to sustain in, uh, in a uh, joint contested logistics environment. Um, so many of the things that you just talked about we're seeing play out um, in, uh, in the Ukraine situation right now. I'll get to that in a second. But first a note, it is highly classified, but we have been writing it to release. So when I look over here at my, uh, at my colleagues, we will have releasable versions of this so that we can go along back to that integration across three axes. We should be able to integrate because they have so many great ideas and we want to we wanna move along well with them. Um, so in, uh, in Ukraine, a, uh, uh, I think some of the lessons learned, I'm sure you've been kicking these uh, around, but a central tenet of the joint warfighting concept is maneuver. We are a maneuver force, all the way back to you know, Valley Forge and the, and the rest. We are a maneuver force, and that's absolutely critical. Are we seeing maneuver in Ukraine? Not so much, right? And so the question then is, uh, do we want to get into this, art or do we want, what we need to do is get out of this artillery battle of attrition um, that looks a lot like World War I, uh, and enable our Ukrainian uh, partners, uh, the heroes that are in Ukraine, um, to bring the tenets of combined arms warfare and maneuver to, uh, to kind of break uh, where we are now. Um, so maneuver is absolutely critical uh, uh, going forward, and, and so then how do we enable that? Logistics, contested logistics. Tactics are fun, but it's in logistics that war are one, is one, and that's both sustainment and logistics, right? And so the ability then to, uh, the, to you know, at the tactical level, to keep lines of communications open, absolutely critical. A tenant of war that has not, uh, that has been completely validated by what we see in Ukraine. But then the ability to keep the front fighting, uh, and the, the ability of the team, the unity of not just NATO, all the NATO partners playing, but the 50 some odd that are contributing to that fight, to provide uh, the sustainment and, uh, and the logistics to keep that fight going. And I would look at it in a couple of capacities. One is here's the stuff you need to go do it. We'll, we'll give you that, we'll help you, we'll train you to do that. You already know how to use some of it perhaps. Uh, but then how do we flow that in, keep that flowing, and then additionally, if a tube goes down, can you fix it? Can you maintain it? And the secretary has been, you know, I, it, probably no surprise, given his background as, a, as a, an army officer and a former CENTCOM, has been ruthless with us about, don't just give it to them, make sure that they're trained and that they can sustain even in that, uh, even in that contested environment. Um, 
C2, very, very important, and one of, the, one of the key battles for advantage. I think the Ukrainians are doing it really, really well, and they have thought about it in a very innovative way, right? In many respects, they've weaponized the iPhone, if you will. Um, so C2 in contested environments is also something that we are perhaps not learning, but relearning as we see it play out. And he who can do that better, I think, will win, and I think they're doing it very, very well. So there's some aspects of the joint warfighting concept that you see play out. You could, we could also say long-range fires, right? And uh, so getting beyond artillery to things like HIMARS and some of the other things that are important are, um, are game changers on the battlefield. So uh, just sticking with this topic for a little bit, there's been, there's been a lot of discussion, focus, including in the media, about um, the support that the U.S. has given to the ground war. Can you talk a little bit about the maritime dimension of this or even the air dimension more broadly in the UCOM AOR uh, or the, in and around the Black Sea? What are we doing to support the effort? in those dimensions, including in the, in, the, in the naval dimension. Yeah, sure. Well, I would say first in the air domain that as we think about uh, how we support our Ukrainian friends, the number one priority right now is air defense. How do we sustain their air defense capability that they have now? And if and when there is this offensive, how then do they, uh, how then do they uh, execute air defense as their troops move to contact and, and hopefully to success? Um, so that's the number one priority right now. Another lesson that we already know uh, exists. Uh, the challenge there, uh, of course, is the expenditure rates um, and uh, the fact that um, uh, they had, the, the, our Ukrainian friends had a lot of old Soviet systems. Uh, those will be expended uh, over time. Uh, so what, it, what comes next? And that's the number one priority right now as we support it. Um, Air defense writ large in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, um, I think it really can take advantage of the high-end capabilities of the NATO alliance. So everything from uh, air policing um, uh, to um, uh, what we do at sea coming off the carrier, uh, that's a pretty well-developed mission, but it all starts with domain awareness. How well can we see? You can't shoot anything if you can't see it. And so domain awareness across all domains, I would tell you, in, uh, in Ukraine is also another very high, uh, high priority. Um, a new element of the, uh, of the air domain is the counter UAS. So there's a little bit of Spanish Civil War playing out here, I think, yeah. uh, and it's probably a, a, something you've talked about at, at great length. Um, and so uh, what does air defense mean in a counter UAS environment? Um, and we're gonna have to get really good at that uh, uh, going forward. That's, uh, that's a new changing character of warfare element that, uh, that we're gonna have to, uh, to, to recognize. In the maritime, Here's what I really re think is important about what we see happening in, uh, in Europe, and we'll use NATO as an idea, and that is, and particularly as they drive to Vilnius with their new, uh, as, they, as they think about C2 adaptation. As my time as the Sixth Fleet Commander, we stood up, um, uh, there was a recognition that it's a 360 problem in, um, in, in Europe. So certainly in the Baltics, the Arctic you could have mentioned yep. as well, um, especially with, uh, with Finland, congratulations to them and welcome aboard. Uh, so the and, Arctic- and Sweden hopefully soon too. Let's hope so. Let's hope so by Vilnius, I yep. would hope, uh, we'll see. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, from the Arctic uh, to the, to the Black Sea, uh, the Baltic in between, uh, and certainly the Mediterranean, and now the Atlantic. That 360 view that you can't take your eye off it, uh, advanced submarine threats that launch land attack cruise missiles has, uh, has been a, a wake up call, I think. And so this 360 view that requires the maritime uh, is really, really important. And I, as, uh, as the Sixth Fleet Commander, my very best day was when I had a ship in the high north, in the Black Sea, in the Baltic, in the Mediterranean, and oh, by the way, down in the Gulf of Guinea. Hard to do, a lot of battle space, but it, re it reflects that understanding of the 360 view and the threats that come from it. The United States, as an example, re re recognized that and restood up Second Fleet, as you recall. So we brought Second Fleet back into existence. And then um, the standup of Joint Forces Command Norfolk, which is all about the Atlantic and the ability to strengthen that transatlantic link. Um, uh, so I think the maritime, it's challenging in a continental uh, environment. Sea blindness is a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think NATO has, uh, and, and, and uh, it, uh, 
across the board has recognized that this 360 view really kind of lands in, uh, in the maritime. And uh, I do want to remind everyone, uh, both uh, virtually joining us as well as uh, in the room, is please, uh, please ask questions. So for those um, online, we have a place on the website where you can type in your questions. I've got them on the iPad right here. For those in the room, we've got a Q, uh, Q, uh, Q code on the sheet on your desk. So feel free to uh, type those in, ask questions, um, and I will pull them up uh, here momentarily. I wanted to talk a little bit about, we've, we've uh, talked to the, the polls uh, as part of the session this morning with the ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, we've been speaking recently to the frontline states, the Finns uh, now, the Baltic states. Just sticking with the maritime dimension, uh, what are your thoughts on how to reinforce what, what are clearly concerned security pictures from the frontline states? I mean, even from the maritime perspective, we can't get... Uh, <coughs> carriers into or around the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you talked about air defense, but how do we help reinforce uh, those states in an environment where we're now at war, Russians have invaded uh, Ukraine, there clearly is anxiety among any of the frontline states that border Russia. What are your thoughts right now on how to bolster uh, some of those frontline states, the eastern flank, which are in a different position than a year or a year and a half ago? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think the alliance has done uh, a really good job at adjusting their force posture uh, with things like the EFPs uh, and, and, uh, and, first of all, to, to our Polish colleagues, thank you for everything that you are doing. You are truly there on the front line leading the charge. Couldn't be done without you. It's just remarkable. You really are. You really are heroes. But as we think about the uh, the uh, bolstering the EFPs, as we think about what has to happen on the eastern flank, as we think about what's going to be codified at Vilnius, I hope um, in this idea of being able to go from battalion to brigade at the, at a very quick notice, the new force structure. Um, I think that should that is a if my understanding is that's a really important uh, outcome from. Uh, from uh, uh, the, the Vilnius meeting uh, coming up here this summer. Um, so I think all team players, now all 31, are working together to think about how do you uh, provide assurances and deterrence um, in the land domain. In the sea domain, um, it's certainly the same. Um, is the Baltics is a very challenging operating area. As the Sixth Fleet Commander, we did ball tops up there for six weeks. You can't get a carrier in there. Submarines are uh, equally challenging uh, as well. So you have to think uh, differently about um, defense, and you have to think differently about power projection. So you can use 44 strike fighters coming off a carrier. That's one way to do it. And you can, by the way, do that and support the allies from outside the Baltic. That is doable. Um, uh, so what are other forms of power projection that could best uh, be brought to bear or change the calculus? Um, uh, you could think land attack cruise missiles, you could think Marines, nothing like a, you know, a thousand devil dogs coming off. And we do that and practice that regularly uh, in, uh, in, in, in ball tops. So we're just gonna have to act and think and act differently up there uh, given the challenges. And especially now, as this is a real advantage I think of uh, Finland joining. Right? And uh, so access to their uh, to their bases as this evolves, and uh, they think through uh, their level of support. Um, and, and one of the strongest militaries now within the NATO alliance. So congratulations to them, and, and how we work together with them to um, to create dilemmas uh, for potential adversaries. I think it's pretty exciting, and a lot of that starts in the Baltic and in the Arctic. For that matter. One one issue uh, that has emerged, probably re-emerged from the situation in Ukraine has also been a little bit of the saber rattling that the Russians have done on the nuclear side mm -hmm. as well. Uh, how, how does that impact your thinking, whether it's in the European theater or in the Indo-Pacific, about nuclear deterrence or how do we think through countries, could be the Russians, could be the Chinese, uh, the, the way the Russians have approached the talk publicly about nuclear issues has evolved uh, uh, dynamic. So what, what are your thoughts on how nuclear issues have evolved somewhat, how it's impacted deterrence, and how, how do you think about it? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think uh, nuclear weapons are a reality that we're going to have to live with. Um, 
And deterrence, you know, I think it's a function of, of at least four things, right? Um, one is capacity and capability. The second is credibility. The third is communication. And I think the fourth is kind of a cognitive thing. Let me get to the fourth one last. So on the capability and capacity piece, you see the United States investing in the modernization of the triad, right? So the Columbia uh, in the, all three legs of, of the triad, very, very important. Number one priority for the, uh, the Department of Defense and all the services as, uh, uh, as, as, as you might expect. On, pan, on plan, I'm happy to say, and uh, it becomes the number one priority. So you have that robust capability that is thus credible. Um, then you have, to, uh, you have to communicate it. And so how do you do that? I think you're transparent, you, your policies are well understood, and then your operations activities and investments, I think, have to reflect um, your commitment to, uh, to deterrence. And I think the, the department and the, and the Joint Force is doing, uh, is doing that um, uh, very, very well. It should be understood that deterrence underlies all of our operational plans. You must have that, and it must be credible and combat capable, otherwise the other plans are really challenged in their, in their execution. It underpins all of those. I know I'm speaking on behalf of the STRATCOM commander on that one. Um, That's okay, and, we just had him in here. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's fantastic. Um, and I guess the last thing gets to deterrence two adversaries now with the Russia and with China, and it gets to the cognitive piece. So we talked about capability and capacity, credibility, communications, and then the cognitive piece. This is work that's going to have to be done. So in the past, many of you theorists here helped us think through how do you deter one great power adversary with nuclear weapons. The question now is how do you do that with two? great power uh, adversaries, um, and I would submit to you it's probably not the same, and a lot of thinking needs to go into that, whether it's here or within the department. Um, and so that's where, we're, that's where we're thinking that through, um, for sure. And um, back, to, uh, back to Ukraine, uh, Russia is a nuclear power, and um, so that's always on the table. On, on the Russians, and then we'll, we'll broaden it to a couple of other issues, industrial base, uh, Indo-Pacific, sure. and others. What is your sense of, I mean, the, the Russians have clearly struggled. Mm. Uh, their ability to do combined arms yeah. uh, has not gone well. Mm -hmm. uh, their ability to do contested logistics, morale, yeah. uh, there's just a whole range of issues, particularly with the Army. Yeah. Five to ten years. Um, what's your sense about where the Russians may uh, may be headed? What are your thoughts on will they be able to? Will, are they pushing to rebound to rejuvenate? Uh, we've clearly seen uh, the Chinese and the Russians willing to meet, and the Chinese have provided some assistance. Mm -hmm. Could provide more to help rejuvenate the Russian industrial base. But where do you see the Russians headed over the next kind of years? How weak do you expect them to be? or how much do you expect to see an attempt to rejuvenate? Yeah, great question. I, well, let's kind of go back to the challenges that, that they have had. Um, certainly combined arms warfare or uh, maneuver warfare as, as we talked about. Um, the things that we expected to see that we didn't and just may now be happening, EW, cyber, attacks on critical infrastructure, we're now, we're now seeing uh, all that play out. C2, clearly a challenge, lots of drama there that you read about in, yep. the, in the open source. Cyber, cyber attacks, uh, all, all of that. Um, so interesting that a lot of that wasn't put into play. I also think that uh, the Russians had looked at their elite forces and their performance in other places around the world and said, yeah, we're good at that. And we can that's translate that into, into Ukraine. Maybe not so much. Not so it much. Did not play, it did not pay off. Here's what I'll say about the Russians, though. They are a learning adversary. And it would be folly on our part to expect that they will not learn. They're, we see them learn in the fight now, uh, to the extent we can discuss it, even tactically and technologically. They learn, they learn and they learn fast. Um, and so, um, the, you talk about a weakened state, particularly in the uh, in the in the land domain, perhaps. But they will learn, and they will learn fast, and they will apply lots of resources to that. So, for us, um, I think then we should not underestimate and expect that uh, that they will learn and that they will uh, reconstitute very quickly. As to the Chinese. Uh, 
um, relationship, if you will, um, certainly a strategic relationship. Xi and uh, Putin just met. Um, my assessment, though, um, this is just Chris Grady's view, is they may be back to back. I don't know that they're shoulder to shoulder yet, but that may be coming. The secretary in his comments uh, last week and was asked about this, and I think he used the word troublesome and concerning, and he's exactly right. I, I'm fully behind him on that. So we're going to have to watch this. You have you mentioned, you mentioned that they might be able to help with the defense industrial base. They certainly have the economic might to do that. They have yet to provide lethal aid. We will be watching that very closely as well. Um, but it is, as the secretary said, troublesome. So speaking of the industrial base, um, and this starts to span into the Indo-Pacific, uh, there has there have been some challenges. The, uh, the there were there were efforts clearly from defense companies to ramp up uh, the stock, stockpiles on some weapon systems uh, declined somewhat. We saw that on Stingers and Javelins. Mm -hmm. What is your sense about a the state of the industrial base yeah. right now, defense industrial base, in the current environment we're in, which is, I know from my time in the Department of Defense, spending much of that in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Libya, we are, we are not, that's not the primary fight anymore. Mm -hmm. It is one where we're dealing with major countries now, not yeah. non-state actors. And what you need, as we've seen to some degree in Ukraine, this is much more of an industrial style sure. war. And equipment breaks down, you run through munitions, mm -hmm. in some cases at extraordinary rates. Certainly we've seen that on, with the Ukrainians and the Russians. So what is your sense about the industrial base now and how well we were prepared for the environment that we're in and how do you see us? We've talked to Bill LaPlan about this yeah. and I know he's been made a number of comments uh, publicly as well, but how, where, where, where are we headed along those lines as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, so uh, I think you're correct that uh, the fragility um, of the industrial base uh, is something that has been um, stressed during the Ukrainian uh, challenge. I think there's three, at least three contributing factors to the industrial base that we have now. Um, the first is um, the contraction of the industrial base. How many shipyards do we have? 25 or so, now we're down to about six. Um, and uh, how that then translates into competition and uh, big primes and um, uh, single source uh, in the, within the supply chain, that's a challenge. Like engines, for example. Certainly like engines or who, who makes 155 <laughs> as an example. Um, so, so there's this contraction of the industrial base that happened perhaps during the peace dividend years, right? Um, the second thing um, is the complexity of what we build. Uh, and so, you know, in World War II, we were pumping out Liberty ships one every three days. You're not going to do that with an SSN or an SSG, and it's just too hard to do. And so to maintain a, an industrial base that has the right number of artisans to, to create these uh, complex systems at speed um, is, is going to be a challenge. And I think the third is just this just in time. Uh, so if I'm in industry in the, in the 90s, early 2000s, that made a lot of sense, right? There's a good profit margin that can be there. That's a phase zero peacetime mode. It's not necessarily, I think, as we're seeing now, going to pay off in a, in a phase three or in, a, in the fight that we see now. Um, so now I think the question will be, how do we incentivize an industrial base that will allow us to find the right answer? It's going to be a hybrid, I think, in terms of how much do we need in a stockpile? And what do we need from a from hot production or warm production line? So how do uh, how do we incentivize this? Um, you know, I uh, I was brainstorming. What are the attributes that we want from a, from a, from our industrial base, right? And so Secretary Hicks and Bill Plant and his team have been uh, leading this. But I just jotted down a few that were kind of important to me. One is you want an industrial base that has competition. One is you want an industrial base where private capital can flow freely um, back and forth. You want those supply chains that are robust and are diversified and are trusted. A big big question uh, right now. You want innovators to have a space in there so that we can that we can move faster. It has to rely, and we should think about a larger industrial base that isn't just the US, but with our allies and partners as the in, uh, industrial base. Um, you have to have that workforce that is, uh, that is um, seen as the ex excellent artisans uh, that they are. It has to be a hardened um, uh, industrial base, and has to be a 21st century foundry. 
right? If we're going to get into the digital age, uh, then we need to have a 21st uh, century foundry. And in the end, it has to be one that can surge. So I just jotted those down. We can debate those all left and right. The question then is, how do we incentivize to do that? And that's the work that DepSecDef and Bill and his team are, work, are working on. The Defense Production Act, the uh, Article Three authorities are now in place, some of the waivers that we need. That's a good step in the right direction. So one aspect of this has been this discussion about the two of the main theaters that the US is operating, one in the uh, US European Command, uh, AOR, the other is in the Indo-Pacific. Um, one first kind of strategic question, how are you with an ongoing war in Ukraine and a prioritization of the national defense strategy on China mm -hmm. and the Indo-Pacific right. and a Marine Corps that has clearly shifted to the Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with General Berger's uh, Force Design 2030. How are you, how are you thinking about deterring and continuing to support an ongoing war in Europe, but also uh, deterrence and uh, effective activities in the Indo-Pacific. I raise this in part because we've certainly heard from some of our European colleagues some worry that our support in Europe is likely to be short term as we move towards the Indo-Pacific. So how do you see that balance? Yeah, um, that's certainly a valid concern. First, let me just say this up front. Our commitment to Europe and to NATO and the transatlantic alliance is rock solid. I do not see us wavering from that in any way. Um, the unity that we have shown in support for Ukraine will continue. Um, and so I am very confident that we will continue in that vein. Again, the United States wouldn't have brought Second Fleet back to life if they didn't think it was that important. So let me just get that one out of the way. We are there in the transatlantic alliances is important, if not more so than it ever has been. I think there is balance. So back to Venn diagrams, right? If you were to look at what do you need for a Ukraine fight? What do you need for a Taiwan fight? There is some commonality. I think early on in this dialogue, there was a, there was a perhaps a counter narrative that, the, that they, one was at the expense of the other. It isn't that closely aligned, um, uh, but in some cases it is. And so, um, so for instance, it's not going to be an artillery fight in uh, in Taiwan uh, as we enable them to porcupine up, if you will. Um, but at the same time, counter U.S. and U.S. will be there. Um, HIMARS, the ability to do coastal like defense, Gimblers, Gimblers and that kind of thing. Um, but it's also a maritime fight, which you're not going to see in Ukraine. So very different fights. So there is some intersection, uh, but they are also different. Uh, and um, so I think we can do both. I think we can track and balance the requirements that we need to make maintain that transatlantic alliance to continue the, uh, to support our Ukrainian friends and actually use that as an opportunity to inject into the industrial base what we need. You mentioned a couple uh, that we're going to also need there. And so this is an opportunity then to rethink how we're going to talk about Gimlers or, or um, uh, coastal defense cruise missiles um, that we kind of put together for uh, our Ukrainian friends and use that as an opportunity then to surge in the in, uh, uh, to uh, revitalize the defense industrial base for the Taiwan fight. Um, so uh, I, I think we can do both. It will be a balance. That's what SecDef and the president get paid the big bucks for. We will provide best military advice on how we think that should go, and then we'll decide where we're going to, uh, where where we uh, will take more risk or or, or less. But I think uh, the NDS is pretty clear, um, and it does say. China, but it also says Russia. On the, on the China front, one um, area that we have been involved in uh, at the Center for Strategic International Studies is doing uh, unclassified war games uh, mm -hmm. to support in part a range of the other classified games that have gone on within the department and within the FFRDCs and others. Uh, our most, one of our most recently uh, published, publicly published uh, war games, which we ran 24 different iterations of um, one of the things it highlighted, going back to the industrial base, was a need, for example, for munitions, particularly longer range strikes. So we run out in some of those Very war quickly. games of El Razams in a matter of a week or so. Mm -hmm. So what's your sense about the state of that challenge and how to start to fill that gap? Yeah. 
It's a very real challenge, um, and it gets to the defense industrial base that, we, that we've been talking about. Let me just talk about wargaming for a second, if I could, though. Yeah. Thank you for that work. Really, really important. And, and even the work at the unclassified level just brings such great insights. So I would, I would encourage you to keep doing it. And the ability for you to then iterate and do branches and sequels and try this and try that, really important. And let me just spin to one thing I'm trying to get done in the next three years. If you think about that line of effort, which is David data enable the, the force and the foundry, part of that is modeling in sim and I think there's a capability that we really need to have in the department and so I'm going to spend the next three years trying to build a robust capability that will allow us across war gaming to experimentation and the rest that will allow us to do those iterations that you talk about now back to your back to your um, to your to your question um, I don't think those are I don't think the results that you found uh, there are um, uh, uh, are wrong. I, I think or new in many ways. Or too. Or, or new. Uh, so I think there's a good understanding that we're going to if we're in that kind of fight, it's going to go fast. And so back to to how much is in the stockpile and how quickly you can regenerate them. The bigger picture in all of this, I think the biggest issue is we always underestimate how much we're going to shoot. Right, we did in Libya uh, for sure. Uh, I think we we certainly did in precision guided munitions in in the Middle East. Um, we went through those very quickly. As a strike group commander, um, I remember shooting hellfires at guys on motorcycles. Right, I mean, okay, well, that's a pretty expensive weapon for that. Um, <laughs> Worked though, it was pretty effective. But um, uh, uh, so we always underestimate that. And so, to the chairman's great credit, he's always out ahead of us. He has directed all of the COCOMs through the J4 uh, on the joint staff to revalidate with some um, kind of sanguine, realistic uh, 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 analysis what our ammunition requirements are going to be. I guarantee they will be, the work that comes back will be higher than what we have in our O plans right now. Mm. Uh, before going to questions, I, I did want to touch on uh, an issue that I know you've been working on, which is the modernization of the force. Right. So um, obviously war, the nature of war in many ways doesn't necessarily change, but parts of, you know, characteristics may change to yeah. some degree. Right. Um, you've been working on force design, force development, integrating data, broader impl implications of the digital force, mm -hmm. uh, and fostering a, a culture of excellence. Right. How are you thinking about the modernization of the force um, uh, over the next several years? Yeah. Um, it gets back to that joint force overmatch now and in the future. And if you read the uh, unclassified version of the national military strategy, the central uh, the, the central uh, challenge, I think, in that is how rapidly can the joint force modernize for the future fight while maintaining what it needs for the current fight, while maintaining what it needs to deter. That's the central challenge of the, uh, of the national military strategy. Um, and so the modernization challenge is one where we don't want to fight the last war, we want to fight the next war, we want to have an understanding of where we have competitive uh, advantage. Uh, and where we can either maintain it or um, in, increase that. Um, and so the budget that you see that includes not only uh, historic numbers in R&D and S&T to help us uh, get there from the kind of the foundational piece to the investments that are being made in those high end uh, capabilities uh, that will be required uh, against high end adversaries. Um, doing that while we perhaps uh, eliminate or retire those things that aren't uh, applicable to that to that high end fight that's the risk calculus that that we're undertaking uh, right now it is a challenge uh, cocoms have to have to fight now uh, services want to be able to set them up to fight in the future and that's a large part of the deliberations that happen in the tank uh, with the chairman uh, and then what we present to the uh, what we present to the uh, to the to the dmag not easy decisions um, and I think it really speaks to the larger strategic challenge that we have which is um, you know, kind of this idea of simultaneity. I, you know, we were the unit power for a long time, um, but that was a historic anomaly. And now we're back, I think, to the real world where the, the, there are various powers who don't have the ability to, uh, to outgun uh, or necessarily outspend the, uh, the adversary. And so now that requires 
ruthless prioritization and strategic discipline to get there, another tenet of the national military strategy. So it's that constant balance then of what we need now and what we need in the future and what we anticipate will be the high-end fight. And then leveraging uh, key technologies. We talked about counter unmanned systems. Notice mm -hmm. I didn't say just UAS, but unmanned systems mm -hmm. in all domains. Back to integrating underwater, uh, underwater uh, and surface uh, as well. You t uh, um, uh, hypersonics, the appropriate mix of hypersonics and conventional cruise missiles, long range precision strike, the ability to command and control that uh, uh, faster than the enemy in C2. How we leverage things like AI on top of that, some command and control system. Uh, or, or quantum uh, and how we bring that together. So the 14 priorities that Secretary Xu has, uh, has the department looking at are good places to start um, uh, going forward. I would also say that all the modernization efforts have to be measured against the joint warfighting concept and how we're gonna succeed in those four key battles for advantage. And that's the work of the JROC. We take those concept required capabilities and we look to, um, we look to uh, modernize the force so that we can win in that high end fight. Again, not the last fight, the next fight. So I'm gonna channel my inner um, Andy Marshall uh, here, mm -hmm. uh, the former uh, head of Office of Net Assessments. Uh, along these lines, how does the way you're thinking about force modernization, uh, how is that impacted by what you're seeing coming particularly out of Beijing right now and how they are working on modernizing their force? How, how much of this is also um, you know, a competitive landscape that it needs to be done because they're making changes as well? Yeah, um, uh, it drives it. Um, I think Andy would be happy with that. So uh, as we lay, um, their ability, their kill chain, their kill web, whatever you want to call it, against ours, then looking for those competitive advantages is, the, is, the, is um, how, we, uh, how we need to think about it. Every decision that I, th I think, every decision that, um, that the secretary or the chairman or the president needs to make should be threat-informed, risk-based, and data-enabled. It starts with the threat. And so we have to have a good understanding of what they're doing now and where they are going. Um, and I think the, uh, uh, the apparatus that we have to help us understand that is pretty solid and pretty strong. So we can do that comparative analysis, lay the two together, look for competitive advantages. One that we have now and we have to maintain as examples in the undersea domain, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. That comes from a really good, strong analysis of that competitive advantage. So before getting you to uh, get your crystal ball out and tell us what the Notre Dame football uh, uh, record will be next year. Yeah. Um, we, we've got a, a question from uh, some of the audience, uh, Byron Callen on weapons programs. Uh, still moving at glacial speed, what can be done to speed that up? For example, uh, what would have to be done to cut procurement time uh, from contract award, for example, in half, for, say for the F-35 or SSN? How do we, how do we decrease that procurement time? Yeah, so uh, I think the, the big question there is we're too slow. That's what my friend here is, uh, is telling us. So how do, how do we go faster? Um, well, first I think it starts with we have to be a good customer, right? So we have to write a very good requirement. Uh, we have to have a good understanding. We have to communicate that to, uh, we have to, communicate that to industry. Um, and I think the services are working really hard, to, uh, really hard to do that. But I think there's some things that have, I, I would put it as in serial as opposed to in parallel, right? So a lot of things that we have done in the past has been in serial. We do this, then we do this, and then, and then we come to the end and we, uh, we have achieved the end state that we're shooting for. Let me give you an example of that, and that's testing, right? So if we can do and embed the testing apparatus in the acquisition process as we work our way along, such that when we're ready at the very end, all we have to do is that final test as opposed to then starting the whole testing process, where did this work really, really well? I would submit was in the B-21. Worked really well there. Um, so thinking less in terms of serial execution of the, of the acquisition process and more in terms of, uh, of parallel. How do we thus, I think another way is how do you, uh, how do you leverage the, um, the adaptive acquisition system that DepSecDef has championed? How do you use military acquisition? Um, how do you seed uh, uh, with the Raider Fund that she has established? Or how do you use the Office of Strategic Capital to go faster um, within the authorities that we have? I think the real, exam the real promise is in the digital, the, the digital space. 
And so I've done a lot of thinking on this, and the great problem, there's this kind of iron triangle, but in digital, right? And it includes an open architecture, it includes digital engineering and digital manufacturing, and it includes that agile software development. Again, the best and most modern systems are gonna be the ones that allow us to do that. Um, and uh, the, the real advantage is that is you get to go a lot faster. You can parallel up many of the processes, and then you get these things like app-based approaches uh, that are software-defined. That's the, that's the realm of the future, particularly to weapon systems that, uh, that, 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 that Byron asked about. Right, um, thanks. Uh, moving to another question. This certainly reflects a view that uh, some Americans have had um, uh, and, and continue to have. Why shouldn't Western Europe bear most of the cost for the Ukraine, uh, uh, for, for the Ukraine-Russia war instead of the U.S.? Yeah. Well, again, I, you know, it's uh, it's not U.S. versus Western Europe. It's an alliance. We all come together in the ways that we can. Um, and so we can look at it from a from a percentage perspective, if you will. But there's other ways to to uh, to come to the fight um, and, and to contribute uh, in the in the fight in uh, in Ukraine. Um, I think everyone's working hard, doing what they can. They're doing their own risk calculus. Their work happens at the various UDCGs, the meetings where we come together, where we we push and cajole each other to to uh, to do more. And in the end, I think we get the right result. So it can be the right result in spending more. It can be the right result in what Poland is doing right now in terms of uh, everything that they have done to host and, and, and be a logistics club and, uh, and the rest. It can be training, as we have seen uh, here most recently, uh, the various teams that have st stepped up to help with, uh, with training. So there's various ways to contribute. Money is just one of them. Um, and uh, they will all meet together with the secretary and the chairman, and they'll, they'll figure out what is the appropriate contribution for each uh, for each nation. Question that from a different perspective on Ukraine, this comes from a former U.S. Green Beret uh, who uh, was uh, participated as, as a member of the Foreign Legion in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, given that according to UK intelligence, I think they put this out publicly, 97% of the Russian military is committed to the Ukrainian battlefield. Why hasn't U.S. security assistance significantly increased in equal measure? It would seem, he says, that there's an opportunity here for Ukraine to decisively defeat the Russian military so the U.S. can uh, pivot to the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, people have raised the question about attack um, uh fixed-wing aircraft, mm -hmm. F-15s, F-16s. Yeah. What's your response there? Yeah, well, first, I, I don't think the, the premise is right. 97% of the ground force is committed, not 97% of the entire Russian military. There's huge chunks that are not but not wrong in that, uh, in that number. Um, I, I think that the work that the Alliance is doing, the United States is doing to provide the capabilities and the, at capacity that the Ukrainians need uh, has been pretty spectacular, frankly. Um, you know, you talked about stingers and javelins. If we were here, you know, nine, 10 months ago, that's what we would have been talking about. And here we are now talking about one high five, Mars. High, <laughs> high Mars and 155 and air defense and Patriots, and, and uh, Patriots uh, as an example, as the, as the war fight has progressed. Um, so I, I think the alliance in the United States has, uh, has uh, uh, stepped to the plate and is, uh, is kind of ahead of the curve in, in, in many respects. Yeah, so the, the, the question I think is, um, you know, why not give uh, F-16s to the, to the fight right now as, a, as an example? Um, that's a really wicked, expensive, and long-term uh, uh, solution set to the current problem. Uh, maybe we talk about that later. I don't know. But, you know, if you're going to spend $40 billion to provide F-16s, that could also buy a hell of a lot of 155 and Gimblers. Right? So the question is, what's the return on investment for the current fight? And we'll think about the future force uh, later. Um, so I think, we're, uh, I think we're doing it in, uh, in, the, in the appropriate way. Good. Uh, here is uh, another question. Uh, from an analyst at RAND. Uh, in Ukraine, you have a Western-equipped army based on the skeleton of Soviet doctrine and tactics. Moving from a fires army to a maneuver army wouldn't be a trivial task, even in peacetime. Will you be able to see the needed return on investment in a compressed timeline of an active war? How essential is moving from fire to maneuver doctrine going to be for Ukraine? given U.S. and European defense uh, infrastructure limitations for yeah. supplying munitions? All the right questions. 
one one pushback would be they are largely Soviet equipped, and that's how they started, and now we're changing that dynamic. So. Um, uh, uh, over time, yeah, maneuver is going to be the answer. What's going to get them to the to the table, right? To the negotiating table. That's our job. This thing will end because of the politicians will get together and figure out, you know, uh, what's the end state, and it's going to be maneuver that does it. And um, and uh, so uh, the capability will be provided. I think at the appropriate capacity will be provided, but none of that matters. Back to the center of the universe, right? None of that matters unless Ukrainian soldiers can do it. I think that's the, I think that's the tenor of his question. Um, so let's go back to 2014 when uh, the post Crimea and then United States and the rest of the alliance started training the Ukrainians uh, in a Western style. Look at the success that they have had, right? And that's a direct result of the training. But I think more is a direct result of that the Ukrainians are pretty damn good. And they're super committed, obviously, to protecting and, uh, and regaining the sovereignty of their country. So to, the, to, our, uh, to, to our colleague who asked that question, that training is ongoing right now. Uh, fair to say that it has been very successful. We'll see it play out maybe in this offensive if and when that happens. Um, but the Ukrainians are very, very fast learners. They are all business all serious, lethal to the core. I would never underestimate their ability to, uh, to learn and then lethally apply the, uh, the, the concepts of maneuver warfare. I think this will be the last question, just based on the timing uh, from uh, someone in the audience. What is the perspective from the Joint Chiefs on theater missile defense in light of Russia's war fighting capabilities in Ukraine? And what would be the role of the next glide face interceptor for the Navy? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, theater missile defense is um, uh, something that Ukraine has showed us is important. Uh, another one of those elements that is perhaps re-emphasized as opposed to learned or relearned. Um, and so moving together with our allies and partners on the appropriate architecture and capability capacity to execute theater missile defense will be absolutely uh, critical. Europe is a great example of that with the European phased adaptive approach with Aegis Ashore in Romania, soon in Poland, uh, with the uh, uh, DDGs that are there uh, that provide that capability, the four that are soon to be six that are stationed in, uh, in Rota. Um, so I think Europe is a, is a really good example of that. And then the contributions of uh, of that, because again, it all starts with domain awareness and sensing, um, and the, the contributions of the entire ally uh, alliance to that to that uh, to that architecture. Um, the glide phase uh, interceptor—that's uh, a wicked hard problem. Um, but what we have at sea right now uh, can be adapted to do that mission, and uh, and so we will. You know, up to the up to the team on whether the, those investments are where we want to go, but the capability and capacity is there uh, to take uh, uh, to take the Aegis weapon system and put it to use in that in that um, in that realm. I think you'll see us do that uh, go forward. Is it a hard technical challenge? Absolutely. Can we do it? Absolutely. Um, just briefly, in thirty seconds or so, your. Any, anything else you want to say as we as we bring the Finns in right now into NATO and hopefully the Swedes soon on what role they play in uh, strengthening the alliance and and then we'll return to Notre Dame before you <laughs> yeah well first of all again congratulations to the Finns and to the entire alliance now that we're 31 for 31 and uh, boy what a success story that is talking about a miscalculation by Putin right you know, I'll break the alliance. No, you didn't. This is what you get. And um, so, um, the additional, the addition of the of the our Finnish colleagues uh, to the fight is uh, is significant. They are a highly capable, uh, highly trained, highly motivated military force that brings a lot to the fight. Not the least of which is a long border that now has to be factored into the um, into the uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, calculation. So welcome aboard to the Finns. Glad to have you. We're only stronger together now that you're there. And soon to the to the Swedes. Uh, the same thing. I've worked a lot with the with the uh, with the Swedes. Um, again, great capability. Back to your Baltic piece. Is there anybody who knows that backyard better than the, than the Baltic? Maybe the maybe the maybe the Poles or Germans and the Finns might say that, but the Swedes certainly do. Um, and to have them in the fold uh, to teach us to help us get better and stronger in what will soon be uh, a pretty spicy, uh, or could be not soon, but could be a, a pretty spicy operating environment. 
better to have them with us. And so look forward to welcoming them too. Well, thank you. Any, any predictions on next year's football? Yeah, uh, we make the playoff. Okay, make the playoff. <laughs> yeah, we make the playoff. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. All right. Bowl game, no bowl game. Uh, playoff. Oh, absolutely a bowl okay. game. I mean, you've got to try really hard not to make a bowl game, but uh, well, yeah, <laughs> well, uh, we'll make it. All right, good. Well, uh, uh, just, just a heads up before I uh, thank Admiral Grady, um, as a reminder, we'll break now for lunch, which is out there. Uh, we will return at 1230 for our panel on, on uh, challenges, in Euro challenges and opportunities in European defense. Um, and so uh, if you could join me before we break. Uh, in thanking Admiral Grady for, for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time, and we'll let, get, we'll let you get back to the rest of your working day. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you.